This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. All right, call to order. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 17th, 2020. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GL, Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine Graham Mullen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll, uh, a roll call. Board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself and answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Bertwhistle. Here. Uh, Maria Chow. Here. Jack Jemsick. Here. David Levenstein. Here. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Sean of IT or Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will know if a disconnection has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and will call upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to please remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period um, at, the, towards, at the beginning of the meeting and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during a public comment period time, you must join the meeting via Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide uh, on the screen and can be entered into a search engine. The link can also be found on the uh, meeting agenda, which is located in two places on the town website. One way is through the calendar listing on the main homepage, um, find this meeting, and then click on event details, and the link will be there. A second way is to go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda link. On the agenda, there is a link towards the top of the page where it states virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using the telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself and state your full name and address and then put yourself back into mute when finished. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Included on tonight's agenda, item three, is the joint public hearing with the Community Resource Committee of the Town Council, CRC. The board and the CRC will discuss and hear public comment regarding a proposed amendment to the Zoning Bylaw, Article 11, Administration and Enforcement, Section 11.25, Planning Board Decision. The proposed amendment would allow site plan review applications to be approved by a majority of the planning board members participating in voting. Also scheduled tonight is a presentation by the Valley Community Development Corp for ZBA FY 2020-39-132 Northampton Road. Tonight's presentation is an opportunity for the planning board to review the project and to offer recommendations to the ZBA. While this is not a public hearing, the planning board will um, will take um, limited public comment at tonight's meeting for a maximum period of 30 minutes. The planning board will not be responding to the public comment, but the director of planning, uh, Christine Bestrup, may reply with clarifying additional information at her discretion. The ZBA will be opening a public hearing on this project on June 25th. Written comments may be sent to the planning department, uh, email planning at amherstmass.gov and by using the online comment Moving onward, the slide will now show the meeting agenda. Again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link. So we will go to uh, item one, 
minutes, and I believe we have one set of minutes uh, dated uh, April 29th, 2020. I can see that we had all members uh, of the planning board in attendance, uh, none were absent. So um, we had these in our packet and uh, hold on, my screen has disappeared. Let me see if this hands. Uh, yes. Were you planning to do have public comment oh, for I things that right aren't up? on the uh, agenda? I am, but that's item two. Minutes is no item one, Chris, and then general public comment is oh, number I'm two. Sorry. Excuse That's me. That's okay. You just it threw me for a sec, but then I'm like, no, I think you're right. we're no, you're right. You're right. <laughs> okay. Um, so at this time, I'm looking for hands from uh, the board uh, for anyone who either has a comment on these minutes, uh, correction, or wants to make a motion to approve. I recognize Doug. Motion to approve. Okay, and I, Jack? Second. Second, great, okay, so we have them on the table. Are there any comments, suggestions um, as of right now? I'm seeing no hands, uh, so I believe we can just take a vote. I will do a roll call again. So uh, first, Michael Burtwistle. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, Maria? Yes. Jack? Approve. David? Approve. Doug? Approve. Janet? Approve. Great. Um, and myself also approve, so that's unanimous. So we're done with those. So at this time, I'll move to item two, which is the public comment period. Uh, I'm gonna look for any hands. This is a time where uh, the public can speak on something that's not on our agenda. Um, so if there's someone here who's just here to make a statement at this time, I'm seeing no hands. Chris, do, I mean, sorry, Pam, do we have any phone calls? I am seeing no hands. I am seeing no phone calls. So at this point, no one is requesting to public to speak. Okay. So uh, at that point, uh, I have 640, so we can move to item three, joint public hearing with Community Resources Committee. And I do have something to read for that. Before you read it. Yes. I have to call the meeting to order. Oh, good. Oh, let me see. Uh, uh, oh, okay. I was looking at one, the call to order. That was like the big meeting. Okay. Yes. Oh, we got it. So um, got it. it is now 6.41 p.m. and seeing a quorum of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council present. I am calling the meeting to order for June 17, 2020. Um, at this time, I will just go through all of my committee members' names to make sure they can hear us and we can hear them. So I will start with uh, Shalini Balmill. Here. Can hear. Mandy Jo Haneke is here. Uh, Evan Ross. Here. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yes. And uh, Sarah Swartz. Yep. Here. Excellent. Um, so at this time, we our agenda item would be moving to a joint public hearing. So I am going to pass the pres presiding of the CRC meeting to the chair of the planning board in order to open the public hearing for both bodies and then um, preside over that public hearing. Thank you. So now I'm gonna to move to actually opening the public hearing. So I have 642. In accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A and the Amherst Home Rule Charter, this joint public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, Town Council have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding proposed zoning bylaw, Article 11, Administration and Enforcement, Section 11.25, Planning Board Decision. To see if the town will vote to recommend the zoning bylaw by amending Section 11.25, 
planning board decision to allow site plan review applications to be approved by a majority of those planning board members participating in voting. So, um, at this point, so I'll be talking to both the CRC and the planning board. Um, are there any disclosures or statements that need to be made at this time? Um, I don't see any hands. So uh, as far as a presentation, I'm just gonna give a short introduction and then I'm going to um, pass it on to Chris Bestrup who will give uh, a historical background of where this bylaw has been over the last 30 plus years. Um, and then it will come back to me and we'll open it up to board discussion. So um, I just, part of this is for the benefit of the public and, and maybe part of CRC. Uh, we're all familiar with the Citizen Planner Training Collaborative. Um, we, they help provide a lot of training and are experts on zoning and uh, planning issues for the state. And they have a de uh, definition for site plan review. Uh, that says it establishes criteria for the layout, scale, appearance, safety, environmental impacts of commercial or industrial development in an attempt to fit, in quotes, larger projects into the community. Site plan review usually focuses on parking, traffic, drainage, roadway construction, signage, utilities, screening, lighting, and other aspects of the proposal to arrive at the best possible design for the location. In the usual situation, site plan approval must be obtained before the building or special permit is issued. Mass General Law Chapter 40A, the quote unquote, the Zoning Act, establishes a system of permits to authorize uses and, uh, uh, of structures, variances, special permits, and building permits. Site plan review is not mentioned in this zoning act and cannot operate alone to authorize a use or a structure. Accordingly, the site plan review usually operates in conjunction with one of these other devices. Site plan review is about details, regulation of use rather than a prohibition, and that denial is only in exceptional um, circumstances. So that's just to give a little background of what we're actually talking about to clarify with people. It's different than special permit. They're totally two different things and we'll only be talking about SPR, site plan review tonight. So to go a level deeper, I'm gonna pass it to Chris Bestrup, who is going to give us historical background on where this bylaw has sort of come from. Good evening, um, I'm Chris Bestrup, planning director. And um, I wanted to give you a little history of uh, where we are with this. Um, when a um, long time ago, uh, back in the, I don't know, 70s, um, it doesn't seem that long ago to me, but anyway, um, the town had uh, two forms of um, permits. One was special permit, and that was based on, as Christine said, um, chapter 40A of the Mass General Laws. Um, the town also had something called plan approval. And plan approval was um, the building commissioner and the planning director got together and looked at plans that didn't require a special permit and evaluated them for the same things that, special, that site plan reviews are evaluated for now. Traffic, landscaping, lighting, um, placement of the building on the uh, on the property, um, dimensional requirements, et cetera. But that was really only two people who were reviewing things. Um, so along about 1988, uh, the town introduced um, site plan review. And um, at that time, uh, town meeting was voting on these things. And um, when site plan review was introduced, it was felt that uh, it was best to mimic both the process and the voting requirements of the special permit because uh, people were quite familiar with special permit, but they weren't yet familiar with site plan review. So in 1988, town meeting adopted site plan review and they used the same uh, voting quantum that was required for a special permit. At that time, the um, planning board had nine members. So the requirement was 
two thirds of the membership, um, which ended up being uh, six members need, needing to be uh, needing to vote. Um, then um, it, it was actually two thirds um, with more than, um, excuse me, two thirds. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little mixed up. So it was a two thirds vote that was required because we wanted to mimic um, the special permit. So then later on in 1998, um, the town had become a little more familiar with site plan review and they decided to, um, to change the wording to say the concurring vote of at least two thirds, but no fewer than five members of the planning board should vote to uh, approve a site plan review. And at the time that made sense, two thirds was six, but if you only had eight members present, you could um, potentially, or even if you had, um, yeah, if you had eight members present, you could um, go with a five member uh, vote to approve something. So um, that was in 1998. And ever since then, the wording of the, um, of the requirement for voting has been the same. The concurring vote of at least two thirds, but not fewer than five of the members of the board participating in voting shall be required for any decision on a site plan application, abstain being considered not to be voting. So um, then along came uh, the town charter and the town charter in 2018 changed the number of uh, planning board members from nine members to um, seven members. And in January of 2019, um, the planning board started to look at the issue of should we change the voting requirements to be more in line with um, the fact that we have fewer planning board members. So uh, the planning board held a meeting in, I think it was January 16th of 2019, and they began to um, discuss this with regard to the rules and regulations, the planning board's rules and regulations, as well as uh, talking about um, potentially changing the zoning bylaw. Um, in June, I think of 2019, uh, the, the zoning subcommittee and the planning board came up with a, um, um, a voting requirement that they wanted to present to town council. And they were getting ready to um, schedule a public hearing, but then they became aware that town council wasn't really ready to receive zoning amendments yet. So they sort of put it on the back burner. Um, since then, it has become, it has come back to the front burner again. So we have uh, a current, um, um, current language that is being proposed as part of this um, zoning amendment. And perhaps Christine Gray Mullen can talk a little about that. Okay, thank you. So um, as Chris said, this has evolved and more time has gone by. Um, it has given some of us, um, you know, because it has been being kicked around in planning board for, like Chris said, for a year and a half. It's given a lot of us time to go look at best practices, what other towns are doing, um, especially towns that are trying to be more attractive to economics, smart growth. Um, there's a lot coming out of Governor Baker's initiatives um, regarding both SPR, but special permits, and also uh, requirements for towns to change their bylaws. So, um, so um, we have come to this, uh, what is being proposed. It did go to town council, um, who didn't see any problems with this. Uh, other towns have this kind, uh, our closest neighbors, um, Northampton has this, also East Hampton. Um, and some places are actually letting go of some of their site plan review and just making it more administrative. We've done that on a little bit. Uh, some of the planning board members who are older realize that we're no longer getting as much signs and maybe fences, stuff like that, because we recently, well, at least a couple of years ago, changed the bylaw to allow um, administration, mostly the building commissioner, to have a little more power to review things. And this is happening on a larger and larger scale. Hadley does this, um, and Northampton, and we could go into lots of other towns. Um, so this is being presented, and uh, we want 
to um, open it up. I'll open it up to both planning board and CRC for general discussion right now. So um, please raise your hand if you have questions or a statement you want to make about this or ask questions to Chris. Yep, I see a hand. Um, Janet McGowan. Um, I have two questions. One of them is um, if Chris could, maybe it would be helpful if Christine Brestrup could explain um, when we do site plan review versus special permit. Um, like what's the difference? Like why would you go into one process and not the other? And then um, I'm wondering why, what is the um, reason to change the two thirds requirement? Because I know other towns use that for site plan review. So those are my two part question. So I, I can say something to the second part. Um, a lot of towns do still have the two thirds, but in my research, what I've found is they are in the similar boat to Amherst where that was determined as a bylaw from the 80s or 90s, and they just haven't modernized or recontemplated it and changed it. But ones that do, the new best practice is to go with um, a simple majority. So um, Chris, if you want to, you know, give again the difference sort of between why a special permit and they continue to be are much more rigorous. Yep. So a special permit is considered to be a use that is not necessarily um, fitting within the zoning uh, area, the zoning uh, district that it is allowed in. Um, it, it may need special consideration. It may need special kinds of conditions in order to have it fit in. The other thing about a special permit is that it can be denied. Um, with a site plan review, there's an assumption that the use is um, suitable for that particular location, that it's allowed, and we often use the term by right, and we use that in quotes because you still have to go through the site plan review process, but it's a use that's considered fitting in that particular location. The only thing is that you want someone to look at the, um, the proposal carefully to make sure that it complies with the zoning bylaw. Um, and that, um, you know, it, it sort of, uh, it, it is a correct kind of um, presentation or correct kind of um, arrangement of the things on the site. And so the planning board often makes comments about um, parking, for instance, moving parking or lessening parking or increasing parking. They might make comments about um, rearranging uh, lighting making lighting stronger, shielding lighting, whatever, um, or possibly, um, you know, asking people to put um, walkways in various locations that they might not have thought of. So it's really, um, you know, the assumption is that the use is allowed and that we're just looking at the plan to make sure that it fulfills all the requirements that we needed to. And we're also looking at the building or the structure that's being proposed to make sure that it uh, fulfills the requirements requirements and that it will be an asset to the town, but we're not looking at the use. So that is the difference. So um, having the two thirds uh, vote for a special permit really makes sense because it's a little bit more, it's a higher bar that you have to cross to, um, to have a special permit approved. And the site plan review is considered to be already allowed. You just want to tell someone how to do it. Um, so that's why it, it seems uh, reasonable to lessen the requirement from two thirds down to um, a majority. Now I will say that uh, when the two thirds was originally required, um, the reason it was required was because the um, people who were proposing site plan review didn't want to sort of rock the boat. They wanted to have something that was um, similar enough to a special permit that um, you know, town meeting members and others wouldn't be fearful about adopting it. And then when the um, when the vote was you know eventually changed to allow two thirds, but a minimum of five members, five members was considered to be a reasonable uh, was a majority of nine really, but um, was considered to be a reasonable number to um, to approve a site plan review. So Chris, I'm sorry, Chris. Thank you for that. That is really helpful. 
So can you give me like two or three buildings that were special permit because the use wasn't, you know, normal for the area? I'm like, so, so I'm mean, just trying to figure out, tease out why you're going, why we go one route versus the other. Like what, yeah, like what buildings got a special permit because the use wasn't considered quite appropriate or allowable? Is that what you were saying? Yeah. yeah. May I go ahead and answer that? Yes, okay. please. So um, Aspen Heights on Northampton Road, I think it's 408 Northampton Road. It's a building that's going up between Green Leaves and um, Domino's Pizza. Uh -huh. And that building is, um, the use is not allowed in that zoning district. And the way it was permitted by the Zoning Board of Appeals is because there was an original use there of a motel and an apartment. And so um, the applicants used the um, section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to say that the use that was there um, is similar enough to the use that's being proposed that it's not um, detrimental to the neighborhood or um, very dissimilar in character. So they're going from a motel and an apartment building to um, a, a larger building that is an apartment building. So that's an example of a special permit being required for use. Um, other types of special permits for use include um, class two restaurants where restaurants are open after 1130 and serve alcohol and um, may be in the vicinity of um, a residential unit in a residential zoning district. Um, gas stations usually require a special permit because they, um, you know, they can be kind of a disruptive um, item in a, in a neighborhood, um, but sometimes they're also allowed by site plan review, depending on where they're located. So, um, you know, uses that are considered to be a little bit deviating from the norm in that particular location would require special permit versus site plan review, which would be considered um, normal in those locations. Does that help? It does. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to go to the next one, but Pam, could you put up um, the slide for people to see that showed all the SPRs that we dealt Sorry. with um, from last year? Yeah, just to show, oh, okay, you've got them on dual. Um, so the- Yeah, there. Can you see them? I think if I, someone can speak out if they can't see them, but the one on the right um, just is a summary of all the SPRs and the types that came to planning board last year. So that gives people a little bit of, of insight, um, noting that there were 15 and two of them were buildings, but we did have uh, four that were that came back to us like a second round for a modification to an existing SPR and then the other ones there. So um, I'll call, I see Michael and then I see Steve Schreiber. Okay, um, I'm uh, wondering what the problem is, uh, what the need for changing this uh, bylaw is. In my limited, admitted, admittedly limited time on the planning board, I can't recall a situation where a site plan review was objected to by more than one person, uh, which would have been a two-thirds majority, a, a, a two-thirds vote a majority, a plurality would have been passed, whatever the, uh, whatever the numbers in the, the bylaw states. So I, I'm really wondering what problem we're trying to solve here by making this change. It seems to me that, uh, that when, the, when the bylaw was originally written back in 1988, uh, the notion of two thirds to, mi to mimic, or at least to, mi to mirror the uh, um, special permit bylaw, uh, seemed reasonable. It still seems reasonable. Um, uh, I, I think finally uh, the the notion that the largest possible buy-in from the planning board is in the best interest of the town and of the developer, for that matter. Uh, if if a developer uh, is faced with um, opposition, significant opposition then uh, there's, a, there's a, a problem there. Uh, if uh, we're just going ahead with, with, pet, with what's been going, what's happened in the past, uh, there seem to be no real problems here. So I, I guess my question is, is, why are we making, why are we trying to make this change? 
May I say something about that? Please. Yeah. Um, so if you require um, a vote of five members of the planning board, you're actually over two thirds. You're something like 71 and a half percent of the um, of the board. So that's actually a more of a requirement than um, is required for special permits. So it's just it just doesn't seem um, like the right thing. Just to add to that, there's been lawsuits over the last decades. Um, I think one of them, the big one that people re refer to is in Chris Memo, uh, the Osberg versus the Planning Board of Sturbridge, that that court case um, said that site plan approval requires only a majority vote. Um, so anytime you go more rigorous on that, if you were to deny an SPR, it opens up the possibility for a lawsuit. Um, but like you pointed out, we, we rare, I don't even ever know of a site plan review that has been denied and it is discouraged from, it's supposed to be a, you're working with improving um, the details, but um, that's, Michael, do you have anything else or can yeah, I? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I think consensus is the, is the goal. It seems to me that's been the goal uh, and uh, if we if we have two votes against, uh, but that's not really a consensus whether it's nine people or seven people, um, but that's still that's still good enough. Uh, if we have a, a flat out just a straight majority, uh, then we could have as many as uh, three people objecting, uh, and it would still be uh, a legitimate uh, approval. So uh, I, if we're not going to go with uh, a, a two-thirds majority, a, a two-thirds uh, vote, I think we should at least uh, keep the not fewer than four uh, as part of the, of the, of the, of the bylaw change. Uh, that would at least uh, go a little bit toward, uh, toward satisfying what seems to me to be a, a concern. Uh, as it now as it now stands, if if we're only if only five people are voting on it, it could be only three people uh, to approve, and I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's um, puts us in the wrong uh, position relative to uh, the town, and um, uh, I think whether lawsuits aside, uh, whether I think our primary obligation is to the, the people in town and not to the uh, legal community. Uh, in this in this regard. Um, I'll move to Stephen Schreiber and then next up will be Jack. Hi everyone. Um, you can hear me, yes? Okay. Yeah. So uh, just a few comments um, in part for the previous speakers. So the what's determined to be a site plan review and what's determined to be a special permit is by the act of town meeting. So it wasn't Chris that made that decision. It wasn't the planning board that made the decision, it was the legislative body. So that's an important distinction. So town meeting decided that these particular projects shall be site plan review and it determined that these particular projects shall be special permit. Special permit is also used for things like height and bulk and you know things like that. But that is how that decision was made in the zoning code. It wasn't the planning staff, it wasn't the planning board, it was a legislative body. The other thing is I was on the planning board for almost 10 years and we had lots of problems with quorums. In fact, we had lots of problems with core. I'm sorry, I actually spoke loud. We had lots of problems with Quora. Um, so, um, and, you know, good for the current planning board for probably not having that problem, but certainly Chris and before Chris, Jonathan Tucker, remember lots of times it was hard to get six people to show up there's another problem of continued hearings. So virtually no site plan review hearings are heard in one night. They're heard over multiple nights. Massachusetts law requires your participation in all hearings. There are some exceptions to that now than from the good old days. Um, now you can miss one and watch the, the video of it. You can miss one hearing and you can participate remotely now. So these are things that have changed. So my, my last statement before I yield the floor is democracy. So I love democracy, right? And the basic principle of democracy 
is that a quorum is 50% plus one. So everyone has the ability to participate or everyone who's qualified has the ability to participate as long as more than half of those people show up in almost all cases, except for <laughs> special permits. Um, no, actually, well, actually, uh, in almost all cases, a quorum is 50% plus one. And in almost all cases of democracy, a vote, a affirmative vote, is that quorum, or that, I'm sorry, that group that showed up to participate, 50% of that group plus one. So you're absolutely right that a quorum of a seven person planning board is four, and a majority of that four is three. So a site plan review under the proposal would only, would be three members if the other members chose not to show up or couldn't not show up or could not participate in the many ways that are available now. So I'm in favor of the changes as written. Thank you. Um, just to point out something that Steve had mentioned on the chart on the right, the parentheses at the end of the specific projects, that tells how many meetings it came back to planning board just to give people. So you can see the ones that are just an asterisk, that's one night and they tend to be very simple ones, but people can note that. Um, Jack is next and then I have Evan. So yeah, Steve mentioned uh, the uh, the related issues with the quorum, which is something I wanted to point out. I mean, I, I see a situation where you know people have to recuse themselves. Um, we may have you know we may not have a full planning board um, given certain scenarios. You know, we may be down to a skeleton crew, say of five people. And if one person has to recuse himself, we're down to four. And, and so I, you know, I'm in favor of the majority in that situation, say there's four, uh, that three would be a majority and, and pass that. So uh, that's just, you know, basic mechanics of the size and, and, and making it work. And I, and I agree with the by right aspect of uh, site plan review versus the special permit. And and also, I just I, I feel it's like it would be a bad look for Amherst to not go with the majority because you know we we do we are we are in a housing crisis, um, you know locally I think we have an economic development uh, 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 struggle basically with uh, especially now with with the downtown and and potential you know vacancies etc. And I guess my last point is I, I feel uh, very strange as a planning board member, you know, uh, dictating our rules. And it just seems like there's a, there's a strange, you know, self-interest where we're, uh, you know, it's like we're, we're not, we're, we're not, you know, a power sort of entity, I don't think. And, you know, I feel like we're, we're voting to how, how we should be doing things, but I think that's, the town council's responsibility, and I think ultimately it is, but I just wanted to say that uh, uh, I'm not gonna abstain on the vote or anything like that, but I just feel like this is the town council's uh, uh, decision, and obviously we're just offering a recommendation. And I think that's, yeah, that's it. So I'm in favor uh, of it as written. Okay, um, Evan? And then next I see Mandy Joe's hand up. Great, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to say um, I served on the second generation of the bylaw review committee, which was tasked with bringing our general and zoning bylaws into conformity with our new charter. Um, and, and this was something that was briefly discussed because the fact that we reduced the size of our planning board, uh, but kept this vote quantum felt like it was, um, uh, it, you know, it felt like part of, part of bringing our bylaw into conformity with the charter would be looking at something like that. And we, we didn't take action on that. We didn't end up making a recommendation on that because to some extent it was a, it's a, um, there are other options. And what we have before us is that there are several options. And we felt like that was something that uh, really needed to be in the domain of the council and the planning boards to 
discussed, but at its most basic, to me, the decision to do something um, is very much in line with the transition to the new government and recognizing that it doesn't make any kind of sense to keep the same vote quantum after having shrunk the size of the planning board um, by two members. So I think there's, there's a whole lot of rationale to do something. And so I'm hoping that all of us on CRC and planning board can agree um, at least on that. And the debate is really over what that something is and what the number is. Um, I, I, I'm supportive of the simple majority. I'm supportive of it for the reasons that Jack said, which is that we are in the midst of a housing crisis and that I think we do need to send a message that when we say something's by right, we're not going to um, erect unnecessarily burdensome barriers to those things. And if we want housing, if we want economic development, uh, I, I think that we need to show that when we say something's by right, we're not going to hold it to the same standard as the special permit. And also for what Steve said about the fact that if you have an absolute minimum number, if you have issues with quorum, if you have issues with conflict of interest, um, that number all of a sudden becomes more significant. It, it's easy to say, oh, it needs to be a minimum of four until you only have a quorum of members show up for something that's usually pretty simple. And so uh, I hope there's agreement that we have to do something and I'm supportive of the simple majority. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, and then I see David's hand. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to try not to repeat what others have said, but, um, you know, Michael asked why now, and I think Evan covered part of it, you know, we changed forms of governments, the size of the planning board reduced, five is now a large number of seven, um, and, and doesn't necessarily reflect at all the reduction in planning board size. Um, but I, I go back to what Christine Gray Mullen said, that there are legal rulings out there that say site plan reviews have to be a majority. And so if we don't adopt a majority, we are opening up ourselves as a town to a lawsuit if say, you know, this, if this by, say in the last year, if the planning board had not adopted a site plan review, not passed it because the planning board of seven members got four votes instead of five and the bylaw set a minimum of five. The applicant could come and sue the town because it's in direct violation of legal rulings that say site plan reviews are majorities. And so bylaws need updated occasionally. They should be updated to reflect the current best practices, the current legal rulings. And it seems like this one, whether it be two thirds or five members, both of those numbers are out of date with the current size of the planning board and the current legal rulings as to what site plan review means. Um, and so that's to me reason enough to bring this in front and say, we need to update it. We need to fix this so that we're not opening up ourselves to lawsuits. Um. David? Um, well, I, I support the change to the, 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 the language for reasons that have been spoken to, but also I think sort of for a substantive reason as well, not just for the changes in the, the numbers of the, the membership. But uh, I think in, in the, there is a difference that ha has evolved as I've learned, I believe, my short time on the board between a site plan review and special permit special permits in the chapter 40a site so, so and there and and there are rules and regulations from state statute about that site plan review is something adopted by towns by municipalities and is not a creature of state statute but is a creature of local law and and i think what's evolved is that it's uh it's as Chris, either or both of the Chris's earlier said, it's a regulation of a use rather than its prohibition. And so it's, it's, a, it's a way to influence design that is already permitted for that um, design and use that is already allowed for that particular site. And that part of the bargain there is to get the, 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 the applicant to come to the table in order to be uh, um, influenced 
by the board in charge and 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 fit their plans in with a broader consensus of the community and that's great and but that shouldn't be the same kind of hurdle i think is what has evolved in the over over time over the past few decades that this has been established in massachusetts is that special permits have a higher higher bar a higher threshold that has to be um uh uh satisfied by by the applicant before the appropriate special permit granting authority um uh, because the use that the applicant is requesting for the special permit is not clearly allowed under the zoning law the site plan these the, those uses are allowed under the under the zoning law and 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 the applicants coming and and is now subject to reasonable conditions and that's the influence that the process allows and i think that maintaining that um difference in the voting requirements making it a, a, the site plan review a lower threshold voting threshold in order to pass is consistent with that model of review and influence that applicants have when presenting these matters before the relevant municipal body and so that's why i i, I think it's compelling and necessary the the numbers and the quorum and the aside is to is to be clear that to to applicants that when uh, uh, they apply for site plan review it's not as the bar is not as high for as it is for a special permit and we want to, and i think we want to encourage that so that so that the boards can have that that potential influence um, there are other issues i have with this that are that are ripple effects of looking at this um, change but I'll speak to that later. I don't want to further muddy my comments, but thank you very much. Uh, Maria? So, yeah, I agree with David. And actually, that chart you have right now on the screen on the left shows exactly why I think we need to do just majority and not two thirds and not minimal four, because I really appreciate that chart because it shows exactly what happens when we go from seven members present to four members present. It becomes more difficult than a special permit, which everyone has been saying in the past. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo it. Yeah, it's, it's site plan review is not a special permit. And so the numbers literally tell you that that's what the the site plan review becomes as it becomes more arduous than special permit so i just yeah i appreciate that chart because you know the math alone i think is the reason why i'm going to support it as written that's it thanks i see no more uh, members hands are right up so i'm going to switch to the public um questions right now so i'm clicking on the attendees if there's any attendees that would like to ask a question or make a comment about this right now um i'm watching and pam are there watch if there's any phone call in fact i'll just ask do we have anyone on phone call right now we didn't and i'm just getting back in there hold on i don't believe so because i believe they're usually at the top okay and i don't see anybody on phone and okay. I don't see any raised hands. I do not either. So I will come back to the board if there's any other um, comments. We do have the, um, Pam, if you want to put up the order form that came from Mr. Bard today. I know you have one of those. I do. Christine, may I make a oh. comment? Absolutely. Didn't see your hand. Sorry, Chris. I don't have the ability to raise my hand since I'm a co-host. So I'm sorry to just bur burst in. But um, Oh, good to know. Thank you. I'll yeah. walk on the screen more for so, you. I would actually be more comfortable with um, wording that included the words, but not fewer than four of the members of the board. I feel that that's more in keeping with um, the history of what we've done. And um, when I look at some of the projects that are uh, site plan review projects, it makes me 
a little uncomfortable to think that they could be um, approved by only three members of the board. And I'll mention a couple of them. Um, Kendrick Place, which has 36 units at the corner of Triangle and East Pleasant. Um, One East Pleasant, which has 135 units um, at the carriage shops location. Boltwood Place, which is in the Boltwood garage area. Um, the Southeast Commons, uh, which is Amir McCheese project that had 57 units and um, 462 Main Street, John Robleski's project that had 24 units. I feel like those projects are, um, I'm very glad that they are um, approved by site plan review, but I, I don't think I would feel comfortable um, having those projects approved by three out of a total of seven members of the planning board. I think that, um, you know, when we say majority, I think we really need to um, stick to the majority of four being a majority of seven members. And I think um, another thing I wanted to mention is that over time, the planning department has worked with the planning board to um, lessen the number of special permits um, in, in response to a huge wave of development back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, um, town meeting um, made all kinds of things by special permit. And so we've been trying, working hard to um, make that not a requirement anymore and to little by little uh, change things from requiring a special permit to requiring site plan review. And I feel like there's going to be um, resistance to doing that in the future if the voting requirement is only three out of seven members. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is, I, I believe that some of these other cities and towns that have a requirement, just a majority of the members present and voting, um, may also have more um, up-to-date zoning bylaws. And I think you know we certainly need to update our zoning bylaw some of these places have design guidelines in place. So um, a, a group of three members could look at the design guidelines and say, oh yes, this project fits with the design guidelines, let's go with it, or um, has more clear uh, parking requirements. And so we would say, oh yes, well, this project meets the clear parking requirements, so let's go with it. But given the fact that we have a, a bylaw that really needs updating and a lot of work, um, I feel like it's it's really challenging for um, for me to accept the idea that three members of the planning board could vote to approve something that's pretty big and pretty uh, you know has a big impact on other people. Another thing that um, site plan review is required for is cluster subdivisions. So we've just been through a review of a cluster subdivision down in South Amherst that required subdivision approval, and then it also required site plan review. And that was a development of eight homes um, along West Street going south to, um, to South Hadley. And that required site plan review. So I, I don't feel that I would be comfortable with that being approved by um, three members of the planning board. So I'm just offering those comments um, to say that I would be more comfortable with four uh, as the voting majority. Thank you. Um, Mandy Joe, and then I um, see Michael Burtwis after that. Yeah, I mean, I understand in some sense where that sentiment is coming from, um, because it can sound jarring if we're going from nine members, two thirds, we'd need six on that board to now majority of those voting, and that could allow for three. Um, it sounds like it's a big change, but again, um, all of the Plan, all of the projects that the planning director just mentioned are all mixed use buildings. And so it makes me wonder, maybe the problem isn't with our voting quantum, maybe the problem is with the bylaw as a whole for mixed use buildings, or the problem might be with the parking design regulations. Um, and so I, I guess I'm not in favor of tracking a voting requirement to not do what is, um, best practices and what our neighboring communities are doing you know the, what northampton does affects whether some sometimes affects whether someone chooses to apply for that site plan review in northampton or in amherst um and to not do this because our zoning is old 
doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I'm just going to say that. Um, and, you know, it, to me, that would say we need to update the rest of our zoning um, to, to get better in line with best practices for today or across all of the zoning. Um, and then I also go back to if we put that wording in, which I, at this point I don't support. Um, if you only have five people present and voting because one person had to recuse themselves and another person couldn't comply with the Mullins rule and so they missed part of the hearing, suddenly you need an 80% voting quantum, four out of five, in order to actually get a site plan review approved. That just again opens us up to a huge number of lawsuits or say one person is in the hospital and can't participate one person had that mullins rule that they couldn't comply with and missed a different hearing because it lasted eight times and one person had to recuse themselves or maybe two people had to recuse themselves and you've only got four people that are actually eligible to vote now you need a hundred percent um i i just that to me is not in the spirit of site plan reviews Okay, uh, Michael, and then next I see Jim. Uh, well, all these hypotheticals uh, aside, um, I would, I would, I'm, uh, I would like to move a an amendment to the bylaw, which would reinstate, but not fewer than and change the five to four. And I make that as a motion. Can we do a motion? I think we have to- Not in the middle of a hearing. Yeah, um, we're in a hearing. But I think what Michael's saying is he would like to add a line about no fewer than four. Um, so that's out there if other members are in agreement with him. Um, so I'll keep calling on hands. Um, Janet, it, I, I'll call on Janet and then I have Steve Schreiber. So I, I have a few things to say. Um, I just read Osberg versus Planning Board of Sturbridge, which may be the shortest um, decision in history. And it doesn't stand for the um, ruling that um, towns can't require a two thirds vote for site plan review. And it literally says, we're not deciding that. So I don't think we have a legal issue here of being sued under this case, which also is the appeals court and not the Supreme Judicial Court. So it doesn't say that. And I don't think we're opening ourselves to legal liability if we stick with a two thirds site plan review requirement, which, you know, towns, a lot of towns have kept. Um, I'm actually heartened that the planning board um, hasn't had problems with um, reaching that two thirds. And um, I wanted to just talk a bit, because I had heard a year ago, this when the planning board was discussing this question before I was on the planning board and I was watching at home. And um, I heard Michael say, talking about like the benefits of having a lot of people agree, even though some people disagree with the decision. And I started to reflect on that and it, it reminded me of a conversation I had with one of my neighbors who's Quaker, who said, you know, if we're making a decision and it's really close, there's a simple majority, but there's a lot of people in opposition, we would not go forward with that action because it would create too much division and there's something wrong with the decision. There's some problem that needs to be addressed and they would go back and continue talking or find some other solution. And that also, that comment made me reflect on two votes, you know, where a simple majority won or lost um, and in our town, the Wildwood vote was super split, you know, with things going back and forth and a lot of divisions from that. Um, Brexit is a phenomenal example of a simple majority vote that has almost torn a nation into two. And so I think that there is some benefit. And I think what Christine Brestrup was saying is there is a benefit to having a lot of people on your board behind a decision. And so I would just offer that idea that no, we don't, I don't think as a planning board of seven, we really want to have three people making a decision on a big, you know, thing like Kendrick Place or One East Pleasant just because we had trouble, you know, having people there. It's easier to have a quorum because of the Mullins rule. And, you know, apparently we can just zoom into meetings or be on a phone call now. And so I think that 
you know, we could think of every possible problem with quorum, but I don't, I haven't seen it in this group at all. And we have been in reduced circumstances. Um, and so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm leaning against, I'm leaning towards keeping the two thirds, but definitely not dropping down to three people making a decision. We haven't had that problem. Um, you know, it, this looks like a, you know, it's, I just wanted to offer that, those ideas. Thank you. And I, I would support the amendment by Michael Bertwistle. Steve Schreiber. So I totally get the um, idea that the more people you have, the um, more right the decision seems like it is. Like there's nothing like a good old nine zero vote if it's the Supreme Court. But Amherst Planning Board, during my 10 years, some of the most controversial votes that we took were nine zero. And whether it was um, a site plan review or a, um, a recommend, recommendation for a zoning bylaw. And so I'm all for consensus, it sounds good, but the way that those nine zero votes were taken was not the way that we hoped it would be. That it was the, the nine zero vote was seen as of nine people that um, had the same mindset. So I completely disagree with that interpretation, but that's how that nine zero vote was interpreted we we have to we have to face the fact that the um, consensus is may not be achievable that some projects are controversial that that um, a vote is necessary and that's where democracy steps in so democracy again just to really assumes that a, a quorum is 50 percent plus one and then a positive vote is a 50 percent plus one vote of the quorum so just another thing is the up until recently the zoning board of appeals was a body of three so it took three people to approve aspen heights it took three people to approve all of the special permits that we were just talking about so we have trusted three people to make decisions about very large projects and very controversial decisions here in Amherst. so I, i'm standing by the the uh, bylaws written Thank you. Um, the only other hand I see up is Janet McGowan again. So um, I would like to gracefully di differ that democracy means 50% plus one because there's t tons of situations where a two thirds vote is required um, in terms of, you know, you know, decisions about um, in, in the town council, you, you know, you can approve your budget by a simple majority, but not capital expenses. You need, you know, two thirds majority um, buying land or getting rid of land. In the Senate, you know, you can, you have to get a certain amount in the US Senate, a certain amount of votes in order to confirm a Supreme Court. I mean, the body can decide itself what a vote will be. And that's kind of where all the gamesmanship can come. And, you know, let's face it, votes are power. And so I'm kind of making a plea for a more cooperative sort of situation where whenever we make a decision as a body, a lot of us agree. And I think that will create a lot more harmony. I know I have had dissenting votes. votes. Um, there was one situation where my vote could have, on a special permit, could have shot down a project. And Christine Bresta very de delicately just rescheduled for a time when there were more people. And I think that was the correct thing to do, that one person shouldn't have that kind of power. But I think for the functioning of the board, it makes sense that a majority, at least four, are agreeing with a project. And there's a lot of expertise on the board. There's some differences of opinion that's healthy. But I do think there's a lot to be said for having a real majority of the board behind every decision, if not two thirds. Um, thanks, that's all. I see Maria. Uh, so when we're talking about majority and democracy, of course, everyone's for that, but we are talking about numbers here that are units. The, the actual units are really low. We're talking very small, like one number changes the percentage dramatically. So I think, you know, in the spirit, of course, we all want majority and, and as much consensus, but we're talking about a five member board, possibly. Well, right now we're seven. So, you know, the two thirds is five. Again, I'm referring to this really great chart of math, <laughs> but um, if we're down to a five member board, 
you know, one person missing makes it either an 80% or a hundred percent. And site plan review is not supposed to have that kind of a threshold. Um, we're, of course, you know, hopefully we aren't down to that number and we don't need to go through every hypothetical situation, but it's just placing that four, I think suddenly makes site plan review a different animal. And that's not what table three is about where all these different uses and different zones have been designated SPR versus SP. So, I mean, because we're dealing with literally like one person missing makes the whole sort of uh, requirement of a difference between site plan review and special permit, a completely different relationship. I, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I, again, I'm just going to commit to that. Yeah, the majority, because we're dealing with such low numbers here, such small units. Of uh, I recognize Doug. Yeah, I, I've obviously not been on the board for very long and haven't seen any meetings where we dropped below maybe six people. Um, and at least a couple of those meetings, I was not allowed to vote because I was new and I had not, could not comply with the Mullins law. So we definitely were down a couple of times there. Um, I, I think when you sign up to be on a board, you take on an obligation to show up and, uh, if, if you're particularly worried about a project that's coming up and having only three people decide, then you need to figure out how to get there. So I uh, basically support the language as written and hope that if people are concerned, they will uh, make sure that as board members, they show up. Thank you. Steve Schreiber. So among the hypotheticals is the changing of the board. So the planning board. So this is the time of year where there's normally some transition of the planning board. So that's another place where you have quorum problems and actually Doug kind of referred to that circumstance. So the natural place where the planning board changes is at the end of June. And so you can't, obviously if, you, if you're if you replaced then you can't continue on a hearing, but developer, <laughs> Development doesn't have that same schedule as the planning board change. So uh, that was one other thing I forgot to mention is to account for that. Thank you. Um, Jack? Uh, I move we close the hearing. Okay, is there a second to that? I see Doug's hand. Is, I think second. I, second. Um, so at this time, we can move to close the public hearing. Um, Mandy, if you can just confirm that we're closing it for both the CRC and the planning board. That's what I was going to do. This is a motion to close the joint hearing of both committees. So I think our, our plan is to try and streamline this. And so it will be one vote recorded. Um, and, and we'll go from there, I think. Right, Christine? Okay, that sounds good. Should I do a roll call and then you can do yours? Sure. Okay. Um, Michael Burtwistle. <clears throat> Michael Burtwistle. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, now I do. That's a yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Close the public hearing. Yes. Yes. And Maria. Thank you. Yes. Jack. Yes. David. Yes. Doug. Yes. Jana? Yes. And myself, Christine, yes. Mandy and Mandy, Mandy is a yes. Uh, Evan Ross? Yes. Uh, Steve Schreiber? Yes. Sarah Schwartz? Yes. And Shalini Balmilne? Yes. I think Christine is unanimous from both bodies, so 12 0. Okay, so the public hearing is now closed. Um, I see no hands up right now, but just in regards to motion, I'm under the uh, understanding we'll probably do two different um, motions, one for planning board and one for CRC. Um, planning board, I think I should go first and then, um, and then CRC. Uh, David, I see a hand up. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and I see uh, hand. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I, and, and thank, thank you for recognizing me. So I understand that the public hearing is closed. 
Mm -hmm. It's now a discussion among the joint committees. Is that correct? Um, there can be more discussion, and okay. each of the committees will be making a motion. Okay. Uh, okay. I've got something to say. Okay. <laughs> you got. You so, got the floor. I, I, I support the. I support this uh, revision, um, and I agree with. I believe it was Mandy who said earlier, um, echoing a couple of other comments. Um, that shoot, I lost the where I wrote my notes, but um, that the zoning right. bylaw needs updating. It needs broad updating, and that's gonna that we need the town will need help for that. I submit that that's just town a, a town council initiative down the road once the plague is past us a little bit. However, I want to point out some some concerns I have with the. Um, the matter, the issue. While I agree, I think that the site plan review voting requirement for the planning board should be lowered to a majority of the planning board members present. I think in order to distinguish between the burden that an applicant has in coming before the body for a planning, a site plan review versus a higher burden, a higher threshold to meet for a special permit. Things get, once you start pulling at threads, other threads become weaker and or become apparent. Because the site plan review is in section article 11 of the zoning bylaws, as I understand it, any decision of site plan review under Section 11.41 can be appealed by an aggrieved party um, within up at, within within 30 days of a, an issuance of a, a permit by the building commissioner, which is a much longer appeal period than a special permit appeal, as I understand it. I could be mistaken, and I don't think I think that that needs to be corrected as well. That if a site plan review decision is made and approved. There's a, there should be a limited time rather than an indefinite time, practically, effectively, um, for an appeal. That, that that's inconsistent. That that, and, and these things become apparent once you start pulling at the little threads of the different pieces of the zoning bylaw, because they are all interwoven or many of them are interwoven in, in, in places. And, and so, so we need a, we need a, a much bigger bylaw update, which is a lot of work. And there are people who've done that work that I, I believe the town should look to hire in the coming years. That's all. Thank you. Um, I see no hands up right now. Um, so we either, whoop, I see Janet. Um, would this be the time for Michael to make his motion or did he already make a motion? He did not, at the time, it was not the appropriate time to make a motion. Um, if he wanted to make the motion, he could now or someone else can. I see, oh, hold on, hands. Um, uh, Joe, Michael. I'm gonna just, Andy, Joe, I just want to say, do you have a protocol issue or is it? I, I was going to say with a recommendation, if, if the motion is made, I think it would be to recommend, um, you know, I think, I think the, a, a motion from the planning board is to recommend or not recommend the council amend. Um, and so if Michael wants to make his motion, I think it would be to recommend that the presented bylaw be amended to read whatever or to add that clause in prior to the council adopting it or adopt the proposed amendment with an additional amendment or something like that. That's how I saw it. Adopting the existing, what we have as the order and then adding what he wants to it. And that would be the motion. Okay, thank you. To recommend that adoption with that addition. Hopefully that makes sense to you, Michael. I'll call on Michael. Uh, Actually, that doesn't make sense. It seems to me that what we need to do is we need to put the motion on the floor of the order as it's, as it's been written. And then I would I would move to amend that order, that motion that's on the floor. We can do it that way too. 
because you're right. If you pitch it, then we have to go through the whole process and it, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to put Michael's hand down. So is there a planning board member who is ready to make a motion? You want to read a potential motion, Christine? I can read that. Here's one. Um, I'll read. What about um, to recommend that the town council amend zoning bylaw 11.250 planning board decision to delete the phrase, quote, at least two thirds, but not fewer than five, end quote, and replace it with words, quote, a majority, so that section 11.25 reads the concurring vote of a majority of the members of the planning oh, oh sorry of the board participating and voting shall be required for any decision on a site plan application abstaining members being considered not to be voting that would be a motion jack i see your hand jack oh, uh, uh, oh sorry I, my thing was covering so i'll go with david sorry well, I was I'll, 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 David, I'll your hands up. I'm sorry, and then Jack. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm confused. My little lower hand thing. It's sorry, Zoom issue. Um, David, I recognize you. Then Jack. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll make that motion that you just read, Christy. Okay, Jack. I second it. Okay. So now we have a motion on the table, and I will look to see for hands for comments or discussion. This is the planning board motion right now and then after CRC will do theirs. Uh, I recognize um, just uh, Michael Burt whistle. Uh, yes. Um, I move to substitute the phrase uh, to reinstate, I move to reinstate the phrase, but not fewer than and substitute for parentheses four for the current five. Okay, are there any other board members, planning board members who would also like that change to be made in the motion? I recognize Janet. I second the amendment if I need to. Um, so Mandy, I'm, we're stepping into town council land here. So I might, how do I handle that now? I think what you do is vote on that amendment first to see if the planning board would like to modify the original motion made to make the changes Michael just did. And if that, mo if that motion to amend receives a majority, the changes on the planning board mo on that are added into the planning board motion. Thank you. So I will now take a roll call. We have an existing motion and Michael has made an amendment to it and Janet has seconded it. And I'll do a roll call whether you're just in favor of the amendment, yes or no, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So isn't it, isn't it appropriate to have some discussion at this point of the amendment? Oh, that's true, that's true, thank you. Sorry, I'm so into that. So first, first I'm gonna put down Janet and Michael at this point. So they have their amendment. Are there any board members who would like to speak to this right now? I'm only seeing Michael's hand. Is there anyone who has a on the amendment who would like to share an opinion? David keeps seeming to raise his hand in video. Raise his physical hand. Oh, David. Uh, David. Uh, oh, I'm, on, I'm not muted, shoot. And I'm on video too. I just, I, um, Do you have anything you'd you like know, to we're, say? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I was equivocating. I'm sorry. Um, the, I, I think if we're building, if we're building this on a scenario, on the hypothetical that that it's possible that there is a quorum of a planning board mem of meeting called with four members present, and that three of them vote positive, I think I find that highly unlikely. Um, and, and, but um, deferring to kind of the, the board members and, and Chris Brestrup's experience, I think that, that um, I, I would, I would, while I support the simple majority, I would also support the amended uh, language. That's all. Okay. 
Um, any other um, members who? Uh... Okay, I don't, Michael, I'll go back to you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think it's so much a question of, uh, of what we can expect to happen. I think that over the last three or four years, the planning board, whether nine people or seven people, has essentially all been there all the time. There's been an occasional absence and there's been an occasional recusal. Uh, so I think the hypotheticals of being down to a three-person vote is, is extremely unlikely. I do think, though, that the possibility of a five-person vote is a little more likely. Again, not terribly likely, but a certain, a reasonable possibility. And a five-person vote with a resulting three-person, three-to-two vote uh, is, gets at the, at the issue that Chris Prestrup was talking about a little while ago. Um, I, I think uh, she has been in this business a lot longer than any of us have. Uh, and uh, I, I think the, the sensibility that she was expressing about, the, which, is, which I interpret to have been about the need for a, a I can't use the word consensus because it wouldn't be a, a true consensus. A consensus is, is in, the, in the Quaker meeting tradition. Everybody, everybody ultimately agrees to agree, whether they really agree or not. That's not what a, but that's not what this is. This is a, asking for a reasonable, but not absolute, a reasonable um, level of agreement on an issue that uh, will ultimately, or that may ultimately, uh, significantly affect the overall feel of what the town is like. I think if you want, if you really, uh, no, that's, um, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, Steve Schreiber. So we have to look no further than the Amherst Fields, Amherst College Fields project that was fairly recently, because I believe that there were two abutters within, abutters or abutters, two abutters within 300 feet on that project on the planning board and there was one absent. So immediately you are down to um, four people on the planning board. So basically the two abutters to abutters had to get a, as far as I remember, they had to sign something to, I don't remember what the process was, but these, these cases of conflict of interest come up you know, much more often than you would think in the small town. Uh, Maria. Uh, another point I want to bring out was one I think Steve actually raised was you know the ZBA is three members three members voting and um, deliberating with uh, four or five people uh, present is not an unusual way to get things approved so um, I think being afraid of the three is um, um, coming from a stranger place that's all I have to say. <laughs> Uh, Janet? Um, I just wanted to, to say is, you know, the ZBA, it's three of three. It's 100%. And one member can, you know, torpedo a project. And so there, you know, the ZBA has been able to reach that 100% voting threshold. The other two members are sort of associates or kind of in the waiting, in the wings if they're needed um, because of a quorum issue. Um, I think I just wanted to get back to the, that point and also to Michael's first point, which is, you know, we've been able to reach two thirds, the planning board for a long time. And so, you know, you know, we're moving away from two thirds to a simple majority of to three votes. I don't even know why. I don't even know really what the problem is. Has, this hasn't been a problem in the past. And so, you know, we seem to be moving to fewer and fewer people on a yay vote when it hasn't been a problem reaching two thirds for site plan review. So I just wanna put that context in here. Um, it just does, I don't really understand what the problem we're trying to solve other than a little bit of a smaller board, but at least having four people vote is more like the way it's been and it's always been successful that way. And so it's, it's been a working, two thirds for site plan review has worked for decades. Other towns do it. We're dropping below two thirds, and now we're drop, dropping below an actual majority. And I don't know why, and I don't know what the reasons would be. So I would just recommend that at least we stay at a majority of the, you know, the entire planning board. Thank you. Uh, Shalini. 
Yeah, this might help. I'm looking at mass.gov under smart, smart growth. And in that, they recommend uh, that that um, site plan review uh, should be, not should be, they say many communities and adopting smart growth are moving towards uh, or have simple majority. But they also have this idea of major and minor site plan review. And that might be something we could consider because they say for minor site plan reviews, uh, because we're looking to a smart growth and zoning uh, bylaws that expedite processes and not treat everything. And then bringing in the quicker idea is like, yeah, when things are really major and substantial, we want to include more people, but maybe for things that are not that great, can we move faster with those things? So just throwing that idea. But it does say that site plan review is typically, um, simple majority. Approval of site is usually a simple majority vote of the lead reviewing agency. Um, thanks. I, I just want to remind everyone of what I said in the beginning about site plan review, that it's about refining the details. It's about aesthetics and environmental impacts and getting the owner, builder, developer to do due diligence at addressing those issues before starting as much as possible. It's, it's not about prohibition. So the truth is all those buildings that have been built so far, even with this restrictive two thirds, they were all approved and they all happened because it's not about not approving them. It's about making them the best they can be. So Yes, you know, some people are saying, why are we going with this lower number? Well, my reason for it is because it sends a message out to the world that we are trying to do smart growth and we do care about our economic development. And now in the time of COVID, I feel even more strongly about this. When I contemplate where we might be this time next year and the empty shops and the abandoned downtown that we might be dealing with, we want to be attractive and I want people to come and risk their money and their time and effort to reestablish here in Amherst and the ones that have survived this to be able to be encouraged that maybe they can improve their building or their site um, without the fear of overcomplication of Amherst. So um, that's why I'm not concerned i of course want as many people on the planning board to vote something in approval the ideal is seven that looks wonderful and we can still have that but it's not going to change whether or not the building is built we're just mostly trying to change it to make it the best it can be on my last statement is what i really think the system needs is design guidelines you know column form based zoning um you know that's what is needed. And when I did my research and more and more towns are even going just to administrative SPR review, they're doing that because they've told me time and time again, because they have good, strong um, design guidelines. And that helps set a framework for developers to come in and already be trying to achieve. So I do think, you know, this is one layer, but we're identifying a lot of issues that need to be addressed in the near future fixing and improving a lot of our zoning bylaws and getting design guidelines. So I just, thank you. Um, I see David and then Jack. Or not David, I'll go with Jack. David, David on mute. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, I forgot oh. the unmute part. Okay. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to move to a vote. Um, I, I, but I have a question before I do. I believe the first motion to vote on is Michael's proposed revision. Is that correct? Correct. So I'd like to move to vote on Michael's proposed revision to uh, include, but not fewer than four. Okay. Um, Christine? Yes. 
Yes. That will require, it, it's not debate, if it gets a second, it's not debatable and it goes directly to the motion to call the question goes directly to your board and requires a two thirds vote of the board to stop debate. What happens if there's not a second? Then the motion fails. So, if so we continue wants, talking. And then you just continue talking. Okay. Until, so David's just asking to call to, the question. To call the He's, question. His motion is to call the question. Yes. And I'm seeing if there's is there a second to that to call the question. A second. Okay, Jack. So at this point, we I will do um, a roll call for the motion amendment that Michael has added that no. is. So your, your a motion on the call of the question. Your, this is the motion no, on whether or not to vote. We've never done this whether to continue debate. So Say it again. The roll call vote will be on whether to continue debate. If you vote yes, you want to. Oh, this is like meeting. Okay. Yes. If you vote yes, you want to finish debate. If you vote no, you want to continue debate. And, and if we vote yes, then we and we have two thirds, then we vote on the substantive motion you go immediately of to Michael's the language. Amendment. Okay, and then we vote on the amendment. Okay, so this is just the first part. So I'll go with Michael. Yes. Maria. Yes. Jack. Yes. David. Yes. Doug. Yes. Janet. Yes. And myself, yes. So okay. that's part one. Now we'll move to part two which is the actual amendment, which is to refresh, it was on the motion to re uh, put in, but not fewer than, and then add four. Okay. So that's what the amendment to the first motion is, and I will take a roll call vote um, for that. So I'll start with Michael Bertwistle. Yes. Maria. No. Jack. No. David. No. Doug. Opposed. Janet. Yes. And myself, no. So that's five no, or two yeses, five no, zero abstain. So it, majority. <laughs> yes. So that motion failed. Um, so we, or the amendment failed. So now we go back to the first motion, um, which I don't see any hands up right now. We could go to a roll call for that motion. Still don't see any hands. So um, the mo do I need to read the motion again or? You probably should. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the motion is to uh, recommend that the town council amend zoning bylaw 11.250, planning board decision to delete the phrase, quote, at least two thirds, but not fewer than five, end quote, and replace the words with, quote, a majority, end quote, so that the section 11.250 reads, quote, the concurring vote of a majority of the members of the board participating and voting shall be required for any decision on the site plan application, in parentheses, abstaining members being considered not to be voting, in parentheses, end quote. Um, that's the motion. I will go through uh, a roll call. Excuse me, who made yeah. the motion? Oh, that was David. I can tell you. Hold well on. David I think it goes back to me. Yeah. And David and then Jack seconded. Jack seconded. Thank you. Yes. Um, and this is for a recommendation to go to town council, just to be clear on what this motion is. It doesn't actually make it happen. Um, Michael Bertwistle. Is there any more discussion? Well, I, oh, I didn't see any hands until right now. I just closed yours. Um, I think we have had discussion, but if, if you have some, want more, then. Well, the, uh, the, there's been no motion to close debate. Do we need motion to close so, debate? So what I would say is Christine asked if there yeah. was more discussion before, saw no hands, yeah. so she was moving to the vote because she didn't see any hands for more discussion. So well, when you don't see anyone- I asked twice. Directly to it. Yeah. I asked twice and I, I, I still see no hands, but I do recognize you, Michael, before I start this, if you have anything else you want to say. 
question. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I do. Uh, and I, I'm surprised that you're moving immediately to a vote on this because we had a discussion of the amendment. Now we need to have a discussion of the motion, it seems to me. Uh, Feel and, free, the, the hand, your hand is up, so. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I agree with a number of people who said um, uh, that, that uh, a zoning bylaw revision of major proportions is what's needed. Uh, and I, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, I think that's a long process. Um, and I don't know how long, but it's, it's gonna take a while. Um, whether or not we should remain with the existing bylaw, which says two thirds, but not fewer than five, uh, as opposed to changing it to what the current proposal is, is, um, is a different question. I, I think maybe we'd be better off staying with what we have and working on changing the bylaw it, to the level that many people are suggesting it needs to be. Um, and I would certainly support that. Um, as, it, as, it, as it is now, I don't think that this, this uh, bylaw change is uh, either uh, uh, a good idea or, uh, or necessary at this point. No, uh, and uh, I guess that's about all I needed to say. Um, I recognize Jack. Our um, we're an hour and a half into this. I've, I've heard a lot of recycling of ideas and things like that. So I'm gonna call the question. Okay, and I see no more hands up. Um, so I will go to a roll call on. Um, you need a second? I do right. see. Yeah, I Can see I Doug. It? Yep. Okay, yeah. great. Second to call the question. Okay, call the question. There's a second. Um, but, but now, do we now we need the, the roll call, the two thirds to call the question again? That's right. The, so this, this is right. a new. This is a new motion, and then once we get that, then we can maybe go on to the the the, the actual vote. But but we need we need two votes now. I okay. Think. So, so not being a Roberts kind of guy, but me, but but. I'm Mark, no, this is good. This is like I was never a town meeting member. This is um so. This first roll call is just for calling the question. Right. And whether we should then move to the motion. So I mean, it's been seconded by Doug. So I'll go through the roll call again. Michael Bertwistle? Yes. Maria? Yes. Jack? Yes. David? Yes. Doug? Yes. Janet? Yes. And myself? Christine? Yes. OK, so now we will move to the motion, um, which uh, you can see it's actually up on the board, too. So. So I will call the um, roll call again. This time it's for the motion. Michael Bertwistle? No. Maria? Yes. Jack? Yes. David? Yes. Doug? Yes. Janet? No. And myself, Christine Gramolin, yes. So, you got frozen in the middle of that. Christine? Did I? Yes. Did, Sound got frozen. Can you go through that again? Um, Michael. Sorry, we'll go through it again. Michael. Oh, uh, uh, no. no. <laughs> and Maria. Yes. Jack. Yes. David. I'm minding yes. <laughs> OK. Doug. Yes. And Janet. No. OK. And myself, Christine, yes. So uh, Chris, I hope you heard. I heard five. Two zero. Five yes. two zero. Yep. Um, Thank you. So the planning board, we're done with ours. At this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mandy Jo because it will be easier for her to um, call on her own people. Thank um, you. Um, I am not at this point seeing any hands for continued discussion. If there's no desire for continued discussion before a motion, I do see Sarah. Sarah. So 
I'm just going to say that I, I think that I would bring up that amendment again to have no fewer than four. And I'd like to explain why I feel that way. And I think that I always try to fall on the side of consistency. And one of the things that as a new town council, we have continually been told is that um, taking guidance from staff that have been here for a long time and have seen how things work and to see how things work with the public is something that we should pay attention to. And the fact that Chris has been here in Amherst working in the planning department for so very long, the fact that she said that she at this time would feel most comfortable with the, the language of no fewer than four, I would like to respect that because I think that she's sort of seen how things go and the fallout of that. That being said, I also really hear a lot of the voices from the planning board um, and I think that the planning board now is seven people. And to think that you that you would need three is is like the the biggest sometimes that you can get for a majority out of seven. I think that speaks to the fact that what what has been brought up is that maybe something's broken with the number of people or maybe of the process, which is something CRC is looking into. And also, you know, maybe we, I think that we do need to look at the zoning bylaws and maybe overhaul them. Um, but I just think that dropping from four out of seven to three out of seven without having looked at what might be broken about the planning board and also about the zoning bylaws, I don't, I think that that would not be as safe. And I, I'm just, I feel like I'm just trying to listen to what Christina said and also to the underlying problems that I think the, the planning board is feeling about their own job. And the fact that a lot of our planning board is also moving on or hasn't stayed makes me think that there's something that they need to feel um, more at ease in their job. So that's, that's all. Cool. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I just want to ask if you'd be okay with the motion as the planning board passed it being made and then the motion as Michael made that you making that as a motion to amend just for cleanness sake. And, and I see a nodding as, as to that as a process. Yes, I think that makes more sense. Yeah. So I will, I, if, if I don't see any other hands, I will move to making that motion myself, the, the original main motion, um, and then I'll look for a second. And then I will, I will then immediately go to reading the amendment because I'm guessing you don't have it in front of you that, that Michael made. So I will read it for you to be able to make that motion as a so moved and then seek a second for that. Okay, Sarah? So the motion that I'm going to make, I move to recommend that the town council amend zoning bylaw 11.250 planning board decision to delete the phrase, quote, at least two thirds, but not fewer than five, end quote, and replace it with the words a majority. So that the section 11.250 reads, the concurring vote of a majority of the members of the board participating and voting shall be required for any decision on a site plan application, abstaining members being considered not to be voting, end quote. The motion is by me. Do I hear a second? Are my, my members around? Second. Shalini seconds. Um, and, and now we will move to a motion to amend. Um, I will look for a motion to amend to reinstate the phrase, quote, but not fewer than, end quote, and substitute the word, quote, four, end quote, for the current word, five. Do I hear that motion, Sarah? I so move. And is there a second? So for the purposes of having a vote, I will make the second. Okay, since I was not seeing anyone else, um, do we have any discussion on it? Sarah. Can't hear you. That was a legacy hand and I apologize for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have those problems sometimes, don't we? <laughs> Shalini. Oh, could, could Chris speak a little more to what were the benefits of making it for, for something like site plan review and what were you, what would be the consequence? Like what were you, what was going on in your mind when you proposed the 
a minimum of four. Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, partly it is um, the public's confidence in the planning board and the planning department. I feel like um, the more planning board members who vote in the affirmative for something, the more um, confidence the public has that the planning board did the right thing. I feel like if, if I saw a vote in the um, Daily Hampshire Gazette that the planning board had voted to approve One East Pleasant Street on a vote of three members positive, one member negative, I would not feel confident about that vote. I would want to see a majority of the planning board voting for something that's that big um, and the majority would be four. So that's, that is um, in my mind about, uh, about why we would do this. I really feel like um, it's it, a vote of three out of seven just doesn't really stand up in my mind as something that the public is going to feel good about. Melanie, do you have any follow-up? I'm thinking about it. Okay, so I will go to Steve and then come back to you if you mm. if you desire. Steve. So the vote that speaks to me is a five out of seven planning board members had just voted in support of having three members, minimum of three members approve this. So that speaks volumes to me. If this were a site plan review, it would have passed. If it were a special permit, it would have passed. So that's a basically a super majority. And so with all due respect to, um, with due respect to that process, I respect the vote of the planning board. Shalini? Shalini? Oh, I'm good. I appreciate Steve's response. That clarifies something for me, so I'm good. Okay, um, and I, I do wanna point out one thing that I think is accurate um, before we might move to a vote, that the buildings that Chris Brestrup originally indicated she would be concerned about, One East Pleasant, Kendrick Place, I think, or some of these other ones that were mixed use buildings, almost all of them had special permits attached to them, I believe, and that special permit still requires two thirds, I believe. Um, so even if the site plan would be if only five members are voting a required three, the special permit that goes along with that site plan review would require four. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think that's the case. And I'm not hearing anyone correct me. I think I saw nodding from Steve, the council's resident expert in zoning. I think a seven times 0.66 is? No, I was saying if five were voting, it would be three for the slight pound review if we don't do this amendment, but it would be four for the special permit attached to that same application. I think you'd need five for the special yeah. permit. Okay, you'd, you'd need even more, five. Seven. Okay. Oh, because it's based on seven, not the number voting. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. two thirds of the minimum of five. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So it would still need five, even if the other one needs three. That's right. Any more discussion on this motion to amend? Seeing none, I will take a roll call. I think we are down to um, Evan starting first. Ooh, 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 ooh. Clarification. <laughs> sure, Sean. Sorry, I just want to clarify what we're voting on. This is on Sarah's. This is the motion to amend to add back in the phrase, but not fewer than, and then it would be four. Got it. Okay. So, Evan. No. Um, Steve. No. Sarah. Yes. Uh, Shalini. No. And Mandy is a no. That is a one to four vote. So, that motion to amend fails. Um, any other discussion on the main motion? I'm remain. sorry, Mandy, can I interrupt you? Oh, sure. I didn't catch, I could not understand what Evan said. I'm very sorry. So Evan was a no. No. So Sarah voted yes, yes. and the other four members voted no. Thank you for asking for that clarification. 
Um, I am seeing no more discussion on the main motion, so I will move to a vote on that, which is a vote to recommend the language that is on the screen unchanged at this point, the, the proposed language because the motion to amend failed. Uh, we are starting with Steve. Yes. And then we go to Sarah. No. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Mandy is a yes. And Evan? Yes. And that is a four to one vote. So that motion to recommend passes. Um, at this time, I will say the CRC has no more items on its agenda. So I give the rest of the meeting over to Christine for the rest of the planning board members agenda. Thank you for hosting us for a joint meeting. And I am adjourning the meeting of the Community Resources Committee at 8.23 PM. Thank you, CRC. Thank you. Good to be here with you all. <laughs> thank you. I know you guys have had a lot of meetings already hours in this week, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Good night. Um, at this time, I have 823. Um, whoops. So how about we use that slide, Pam, and I'll announce Ooh. to everyone that we'll take a five minute break um, if people need to go on and um, we'll come back here at 828 and we'll resume with item uh, four, the review and recommendations to ZBA on Valley Community Development Court, 132 Northampton Road. So I'll see everybody in five minutes. Thank you, CRC. Okay. So All right, so I'll at least call the meeting back in. We took a, be a brief break um, so I'm just going to say now we're moving on to uh, item four, review and recommendations to ZBA, ZBA FY 2020-39, Valley Community Development Corp, 132 Northampton Road. Request for a comprehensive permit under MGL Chapter 40B to construct a new two and a half story residential multifamily building containing 28 small studio apartments and related common areas on an approximate 0.88 acre property located at 132 Northampton Road, map 14C, parcel 8, general residence, RG, and educational ED zoning districts. Okay, welcome. Um, I, I think we have a few presenters. If you want to introduce yourselves, um, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, and then after, uh, I just want to know, do you want questions at the end? Or so in that's, between this is presenters? Yep. So uh, this is Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager for Valley Community Development Corporation. Uh, Rachel, can you introduce yourself too? Sure. Uh, this is Rachel Leffler. I'm a principal landscape architect at Berkshire Design Group. Um, and Tom? Uh, yeah, hi, Tom Chalmers, um, Austin Design um, Architect. I am, I, I, whatever the committee prefers. Uh, if you want me to run through the full presentation and hold questions till the end, that's fine. If you want to call out questions as we go along, that's fine too. Uh, it might be a little easier that way because sometimes they have to do with a particular slide. And once we've passed that slide, we have to go back and find it. So I guess that's my suggestion. Okay, uh, and approximately how long is your uh, presentation? It depends how many questions you have. <laughs> so no I, questions. Say, I can get through it in about 20 minutes. Um, okay. I, I'd like to suggest that I move briskly um, because you've had a long discussion already and we've been to the planning board prior for this project and already given a presentation. So I think of this more as an update, but Let's just launch in and see how it goes. So if um, I see hands raised during your presentation, I will let, I'll say uh, there's a hand raised and it will only okay. be at this point members. Um, and before you start, I just, Jack Jemsick, you have your hand up. Is there something you want to say? Yeah, I just want to say, I, um, I've said this before. I did, you know, a project, you know, a year or two prior regarding this site, uh, but it's a recommendation and um, you know, I have no vested interest in this project uh, at this right. time, and just want to let that be said. Thank you for your disclosure, Jack. That's mm -hmm. good. Yes. 
Um, sounds like it was in the past, so okay, great. And it's just recommendations today. So, and um, at this point now, I'll turn it back to um, Ms. Laura. Baker. <laughs> Thank you. I was gonna say Laura, everyone's saying Laura, but I'm like, Ms. Baker. <laughs> so welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. So what is noteworthy on this first slide is um, if you want to know even more than you're going to learn tonight, um, there is a wealth of information. There is a town web page specific to this project with uh, a lot of material. Um, just because you're the planning board, we wanted to make sure that you noted um, that the proposed project is consistent with other pl planned documents, planning documents in the town of Amherst. Um, I tend to put a lot of writing on my slides so we can send them around after because you may not have a chance to read everything that's on here as we go. But just noting that this need for these very small um, single person units and units for homeless persons has been identified um, through the years in a number of different Amherst town planning documents. Um, and there is a long history of Amherst efforts as a municipality um, and in its departments trying to foster um, especially housing for homeless individuals. Going back to 2008 when Amherst issued an RFP to study the creation of these kind of units, Valley uh, conducted a study and actually made an offer at that time on a property close to town and the property owner refused the offer and wanted considerably more. Um, and so that just fell through. Um, more recently, there was a town forum on homelessness in 2016. Uh, the town planning department did a tour with a number of developers trying to kind of uh, spur some interest in developing this kind of housing. And then ultimately the town awarded Valley a $50,000 planning grant to try to locate a site. Uh, there were several townwide forums on affordable housing with highlights on this topic. Uh, and then the zoning subcommittee and planning board held hearings to discuss a zoning amendment to facilitate single person occupancy housing development uh, that was approved at the Springtown meeting in 2017. Uh, we looked at um, multiple sites, probably about two dozen uh, during 2018 and eventually acquired 132 Northampton Road in January of 2019. Um, we sought funding from the town. So the Amherst uh, CDBG Advisory Committee held hearings, uh, recommended a $200,000 CDBG planning grant. And then ultimately the CPA recommended a $500,000 grant for project implementation. Um, at that point, there was a pretty lively um, local debate. Uh, there were a number of community events. There was an open town meeting of residents with more than 80 people there. There are multiple letters and newspaper articles written. And following that kind of period of intense activity, uh, town council approved the CPA recommendation uh, by a vote of 11 in favor and one abstention. Um, this year, the town council provided a letter of support for our project eligibility letter to the state. Uh, three town councilors came to the state site visit. Um, and again, multiple groups and community letters were submitted, both pro and con, um, during a 30-day public comment period. Um, the level of community participation, I think, has been pretty high. Um, we, Valley, has had public meetings with these various uh, municipal boards. Um, in addition, we've met with uh, abutters and neighbors. Uh, we've met with a number of local groups. Uh, and I won't read them all, but We've been door knocking. Um, we've been in, in consultation a lot with the planning and zoning department, but also with other uh, town departments, you know, DPW, fire department, uh, things like that. Um, the methods that we've used to inform the community uh, have been this wonderful webpage that the town planning staff has set up. Public meetings, over 30 articles, opinions, and letters that were published in local newspapers. We also did radio interviews. Um, and we have more than 60 letters and written comments, both again pro and con uh, that have been submitted uh, and dozens of speakers again pro and con at public meetings. Uh, and we have PowerPoint presentations that are on the town website prepared by neighbors and abutters, um, as well as by Valley. Um, people are hopefully familiar at this point with the site. Uh, it's here in light green. Uh, it's on Northampton Road. It's approximately halfway between University Drive and up here at the town center directly adjacent to the Conway Fieldhouse uh, and Pratt Athletic Field. 
this is how we look at the site and its benefits. Uh, it's four tenths of a mile from the town center and the closest bus stop, six tenths of a mile from downhill to the major shopping centers and walking distance to multiple service providers, including the community health center uh, at the Bang Center. It's on a major road, it's connected to public water and sewer. It's a just under an acre lot. It's cleared and relatively level for Northampton Road. Uh, abutters are primarily residential, both single family and multifamily, uh, both owner occupied and rental. Uh, it's right at the junction of three zoning districts, ED, RG, and RN. And for most of our planning, we thought we were entirely in RG, but there's a little tiny sliver that's in ED uh, that we think was just kind of a mapping overlay glitch that happened at some point in time. There are several other dense housing uses nearby, some condos, residence halls, and uh, a senior housing development. Um, what is proposed are 28 small studio apartments designed for single adults. Uh, each apartment includes a bathroom and a kitchenette. Common areas include a central kind of common living and dining area, multi-use room, a laundry, outdoor patio, and some gardening space. Uh, we're providing two on-site offices, one for property management and one for a resident services coordinator. Uh, it is a two and a half story building. Uh, the half story is uh, a full living level, but it's partly below grade, uh, 28 units. Two of the 28 units are fully handicapped accessible. Uh, the average units, unit size is 235 gross square feet and the accessible units are significantly larger. All in the building is just under 12,000 gross square feet. Uh, the income restrictions, uh, we're attempting to have a number of tiers of, of income levels so that this is a mixed income property. Um, one of the main incentives obviously was to provide units that have a homeless preference for folks who are very low income, 30% of the area median income, and would have a project-based rental subsidy. So people who live there pay approximately 30% of their income for rent. Two units that would have a preference for clients of the Department of Mental Health, again with the, the subsidy. Um, eight units restricted to people 50% of the area median income or less with a fixed rent. Um, and eight studios for people 80% AMI and less with a fixed rent. Um, and these rents include all of the utilities, uh, heating, cooling, hot water, electric. Uh, these are the current income restrictions, 30% AMI just under 18,000, 50% just under 30,000, 80% just under 48,000. This is what those people earning those amounts can afford if they pay 32% of their income for their uh, rent and utilities. Um, and so this is our um, look at the affordability ranges for these different units. Uh, the development, there's been a lot of discussion about kind of who is homeless um, and what are their characteristics. Um, so the development can house but is not limited to people who are chronically homeless, which is defined as people who have long-term or repeated homelessness coupled with serious mental illness, substance use disorder, or disability. Nationally, about 24% of homeless persons meet this definition. Um, the overall definition for someone to be homeless is much broader. Um, it could be someone who's doubled up, someone living in substandard housing, someone who has a domestic violence in their current residence, someone who's at risk of homelessness because they're paying more than 30% of their income for rent, and a variety of other ways that someone might be defined as a homeless individual. This is supportive housing. And so uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, developing a supportive services plan. That draft plan is av available on the town's website. Um, these are just some highlights of it. Uh, and we'll, we will provide an on-site resident services coordinator, uh, 27 and a half to 30 hours per week. And their primary function is to help tenants connect with community-based services, uh, to coordinate on-site functions for tenants, uh, to coordinate and or provide transportation. Property management will have an on-site presence about 20 hours a week. They have kind of a different um, objective. Uh, they're to maintain the property, collect rents, enforce the terms of the lease. We have memorandums of understanding with several other community agencies in place that specialize in serving low-income and homeless persons. Uh, Department of Mental Health will provide kind of comprehensive wraparound services for any clients that they refer. 
So homeless tenants uh, will be referred uh, into the property from local agencies, and those agencies need to commit to provide these kind of transition services for typically the first nine to 12 months of tenancy. And then as they withdraw from that level, high level of service, they will be connecting tenants with ongoing community-based uh, services. Uh, the ZBA hearing schedule is here. The opening hearing is uh, next week on Thursday, June 25th at 6, also on Zoom. And the continued hearing date has already been set for a week later. You are all, of course, welcome to join. Um, we brought some information about a comparable project that is just now finishing construction. It's in Northampton at 82 Bridge Street. Uh, like the Amherst project, it's located on Route 9, walking distance to downtown. Uh, it's a significantly smaller parcel. It's less than half an acre. Uh, it's a historic house that's being renovated with a large new addition. Uh, it's converting from 15 bedroom lodging house to 31 studio apartments. Uh, it has less on-site parking than is being proposed in Amherst. It has 14 parking spaces or 0.45 spaces per unit. Uh, the apartments are similar in size and scale. Uh, it will house homeless persons, uh, Department of Mental Health clients, and other low-income individuals. And there's less on-site staffing. So two days a week of property management, about 15 hours a week of resident services coordinator. Uh, we held a lottery for uh, tenants who were interested in moving to this property in January of 2020. We had 250 qualified applicants apply. And of these, 152 reported that they were homeless. Um, this property, it's called Sergeant House, is due to complete construction within the next week or two and lease up to tenants beginning the end of June. Uh, the tenant profile at that property is somewhat similar, although it's a little more uh, slanted toward the very low income end of the spectrum. Um, and the highest income group is 60% AMI rather than 80% AMI. You may have driven by the site. I hope that you have and I hope that you will um, because it's very beautiful. Uh, it's a historic 1820 building uh, that was basically taken down to the bare bones and is being lovingly restored. Um, and then it has a more contemporary style addition on the back. That's the view from the back. This is the view looking at the front of the building. It's just two do doors down from historic Northampton and it is in a National Register Historic District. This is the interior of some of the units um, that are getting finished up at that building, just to give people a sense of what a unit might look like. Um, it's a little hard to tell from photos how big they are, um, but this is a typical kind of kitchenette, just so someone might see what that looks like. Um, it's a, it's a full-size but small refrigerator. It's a 24-inch range and oven. It's a microwave. It's a sink. You know, it's some counter space and some a little bit of cupboard storage. So it's kind of all the basics and it's small, but it's, it's quite functional. So these are excerpts from the plans that we've submitted for the zoning permit. There is within their zoning application, uh, several pages of lists for zoning waivers, many of which are very kind of, um, I would say technical in nature. Uh, the ones that I listed here, I'm calling them highlights, are the ones that I think of as being a little more substantive. If you want to see the complete list, um, it is available online. So uh, the number of units in this building is 28, whereas the apartment building limit is 24. Uh, the density of units per lot area is higher than would be allowed normally. Uh, the parking is 0.57 spaces per unit, 16 spaces total. Uh, the maximum lot coverage for uh, all pervious and impervious surfaces uh, is 45% as opposed to the, the norm of 40%. And we're asking that as part of the comprehensive permit process, the ZBA brings in and encompasses other town permits. And here are a few examples of those kinds of other permits. And so the ZBA is kind of the funnel and they consult out with the various boards. So the style of the building, um, we would call traditional slash Victorian. Um, the inspiration for it was we looked at a variety of residence kind of dorm, older residence halls on the Amherst and Smith College campuses. Um, these are some 3D renderings of the building. Uh, this is looking, this is the driveway area, um, and this is the facade that would be facing Northampton Road. Um, this is the facade that would be facing the Conway Fieldhouse. No, sorry. This is the rear of the building, facing the track. 
And this is the side of the building that would be facing the Conway Fieldhouse. When we came to the uh, planning board in, I believe it was February, there was a suggestion that we prepare some graphic to try to illustrate the size and scale and massing of the proposed building, building as proportionate to its neighbors. So here we are, this is Northampton Road, going to Hadley, going to Amherst, this is 132. So this is what you would see if you were standing here on the sidewalk looking across Northampton Road at the new building. This is what you would see if you were standing directly in front of it. And we did this, the architects did this with a variety of neighboring buildings. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that the building looks teeny and it's partly because it's set so far back on the lot. It's about a hundred feet back on the lot. Um, so it does abut, it is a neighbor to um, a larger structure, which is the Conway Field House, as well as a slightly smaller structure, which is this um, Victorian house here. I think I'm going to hand it to Rachel to talk you through just the basic elements of the proposed site plan. You there, Rachel? Yeah, can you hear me? I can, and I'll point for you if you want. Okay, great. Um, one thing that we wanted to take into consideration is uh, improving. So the site had an existing house on it. Um, and the house was really, really tucked up close back to the to the field. Um, it, was, it didn't meet the setback requirements. Um, and we also were taking in consideration the massing of, of the building in relationship to other yards along Northampton Road. And we felt that if we if we inched it forward into the lot closer to Northampton Road a little bit, we could um, give a little bit more breathing room between the, the apartment building and the adjacent use of the college. Um, we also were taking into consideration accessibility. So early on, many of the discussions uh, were looking at the existing grades on site and how we could place the finished floor of the apartment building so that we wouldn't need steps into the building. So anyone coming in um, on a wheelchair or who um, is mobily challenged would have an easier time getting into the building. So all sidewalks are fully accessible. They're less than 5%, so no railings or landings are needed. Um, we also looked at trying to make sure that uh, any of the service elements were kind of tucked away from visibility from Northampton Road as much as possible. Um, so the units, the HVAC units are tucked away behind the building massing, um, tucked way out of sight from Northampton Road. Um, additionally, the, you know, the dumpster area, which we have capacity for an eight yard and four yard dumpster or eight yard and six yard dumpster, that is screened with fencing and tucked away in the back of the site. Um, across the site, there's nine feet of grade change. So coming from Northampton Road, if you're driving up or down, uh, your sight lines would not encounter the dumpster area. It's only for those driving into the site that would see it. Um, and we placed it in that location. We heard comments from the planning board before that um, you may wanted to tuck that somewhere else, but there was a feasibility issue of getting the dumpster truck to pick it up and turn around. So that's where that needs to be. Also back there, we're accommodating things like the storage shed for gardening equipment and, and some salt. Um, and we're anticipating a need for a transformer on site and we're placing it back there as well. So it's not in the, in the streetscape along Northampton Road. Um, in addition, uh, we have some bike storage, covered bike storage in that area. Um, and and um, we have we're also trying to minimize the impact of the parking area on site and kind of keeping with the residential feel of the neighborhood. So we were using asphalt sur surfacing because it's fairly durable for half of the spaces and their full size spaces. Um, but then the other areas for parking that we don't anticipate having a heavy use, um, we're using grass pavers as an alternative there uh, to soften that. Um, and also areas for, for turning around in the back of the site, we're using that as an alternative to again, minimize the impact of, of paving on the site. Um, we anticipate uh, potential gardening for residents here. Uh, there are two garden areas zones, one to the south and one uh, to the west, as Laura's pointing out now. 
to take advantage of different lighting conditions for different types of plants. Um, additionally, um, on the lower level, so I should mention that as, as someone enters into the apartment building, they enter into a lobby that's at the mid-level. Um, and the building has an elevator um, and stairs that go up and down. Um, so at the lower level, there, there is more, um, there's a gathering area and a connection out to a lower level patio. So that patio area is fully accessible from the building also. Um, and that area has seating and screen evergreen and deciduous planting. This plan has a very a high density of planting, which we're really excited about uh, to help screen this area from, from the neighbors and make it much more um, therapeutic for the residents who are there. In addition, um, this user group has is need, needs a smoking structure, smoking pavilion, um, and that is being shown on the site plan. Tucked away, facing away from the apartment building um, with a bench and then more additional screening between it and the apartment building and screening between it and the, and the um, field house. Um, stormwater on site, like we are trying to use low impact development techniques. Uh, so as much as we can, we're trying to get away from piped systems and infrastructure systems. Not only do they own, add cost, um, but if we can, we like to use uh, lighter methods. Uh, so the plan, the majority of the plan, we're using grading to define a detention, retention area um, towards Northampton Road a subtle depression in, in the front. Um, we're also using a rain garden adjacent to the parking areas to deal with stormwater quality and clean up, clean up any water coming off of the parking area before it goes into that retention, uh, retention basin. Um, Laura, have I anything else I should mention? <laughs> Sure. Um, we're showing these, this main pathway coming in and this main pathway as being uh, in concrete and then using a permeable kind of, I don't know what it's called, the Flexi shredded tape. rubber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shredded rubber <laughs> for these pathways. And we've scaled them down a bit to a more residential kind of, you know, scale. Yeah. Um, people probably know on the planning board that this, there is an existing sidewalk here it's in kind of rough condition, um, and there is a mass DOT plan to improve sidewalks on both sides of Northampton Road to five feet wide. Uh, they're all supposed to be handicapped ac accessible, according to mass DOT, um, and there will be two uh, crossings with lights that are planned, uh, one at Orchard Street and one at Hazel Street. So again, we have connectivity into what will be an improved pedestrian access um, system. I think. I think you did a good job, Rachel. I think I'm going to go on. Okay. I do see one hand up. Uh, okay. Can you take a question from Maria Chow? Of course. Um, I'm not a landscape architect, so I don't know what this term means. Uh, level spreader, C. Yeah. Is that a wall or is that at grade? What is that exactly? At little? C. Yeah. It's a, it's a fancy word for. Um, an area of riprap that is level. So it takes any channelized flow that's coming out of a pipe um, and it distributes it evenly across in gravity flow across a larger surface so that you don't have scouring down the slope of the pipe. Okay, so that sort of um, C-shaped thing is not yeah. like a wall or anything? No, that's like a, that's like riprap. Yeah. Okay. okay. But it's gonna sit, Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, It. it you wouldn't see it right. as a passerby so much. It's kind of sitting pretty much at grade, right? Yeah, yeah. And then my other question is, maybe this is something more for the architect, but the little condensers for the mini splits right by the smoking pavilion. No, yeah, I was wondering if those could, you know, they can be noisy. They're made pretty well nowadays where they're not super noisy, but if there's just another spot that's not right by where people are relaxing outside. But yeah, it's a pretty minor thing. So yeah, we definitely we may play around with them a little bit. It's always challenging to find a spot. They can't be near windows. They can't be near, you know, it's just it's it's one of the challenges that we'll struggle with a little bit with a, a, a building that has peaked roofs, uh, flat roof buildings. You just throw them on the roof, but we didn't want a flat roof building. So we're trying to find places for them around the site. So this is the elevation. Um, 
that you would see this is on the driveway side. So you would be coming in as Rachel described on grade um, into a main lobby area and it's essentially a split level. You know, the lobby's on, on grade and then you have a choice of going up or down stairs or up or down within an elevator. Um, we're trying to pick up some of the traditional uh, cladding materials like the, the field stone kind of look facade that um, is present in the Conway Field House, and then a traditional clabbered look. Um, this is the side of the building that would be facing Northampton Road, and this isn't an exact rep representation of grade. It's a little more gradual than this, but it is kind of sloping across the building that way. Um, and so this is the side that would be facing uh, the, the field house. Um, here are the doors that would egress onto that patio space that we looked at. And then this is the back of the building that would be looking toward the uh, track. Uh, Tom, maybe I'll let you chime in in terms of, this is a little small to look at, but in terms of the cross section as well as the roof height. Um, sure. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the features of the building is that you enter um, into the building at the at the along the side, kind of at the midpoint. So when you enter to the building, um, you're basically in the center horizontally, and you can and it's quick to get to either section of the of to, to either uh, area for your apartments. And we're doing the same uh, vertically in section. So. Um, at the, uh, this here is the covered portico at the entrance, and this is at the grade that the driveway is at, basically. Um, and then as you come in, you come in at grade, and you have, there's an open stairway, and you go either down to the ground floor level or up to the second floor level by stair. There's also an elevator that stops at the lobby, the ground floor, first floor, and the second floor. And so you're kind of you're kind of entering the building at, at, at as close as we can get to mid height as well. And this also allows us to have the uh, common spaces, uh, the common area room on the ground floor also exits out at grade um, to go directly out in that patio. So there's no no step or in, or ramp required. So most of it's slab on grade construction. There is a small um, kind of sub basement for utilities. Um, for the and then in terms of the roof height, this is just a diagram that shows that the, the this is the allowable roof height and this is the mid height that we're achieving and th that is taken from actually the the basically the lowest point on the building. Um, the, so it's a along the street along yeah it's, it's pretty conservative along the the street elevation is is quite a bit higher than this. Um, the average across the street elevation is a little bit higher. We took it from the from the lowest point here. So, Tom, can you can you? I can, I couldn't read these, <laughs> but this is showing where a forty foot high building would be, a roof height, right? Mid, the mid, midpoint yeah. of, the, of the gable. Right, and this is where we are at. I can't. So read we're either. maybe almost two feet below the maximum. Is right. that fair? Okay. Yep. So this is the uh, ground floor. Um, again, as we've been describing, you would enter here, be able to go up or down. Um, on the ground floor, we have most of the common use areas. The common room is here, which is kind of a multi-purpose room. It can serve as a gathering space, a workshop training space, a eating space. Um, and it leads out to the patio. The resident services coordinator office would be directly next door to that room. We have a guest or public bathroom here. Um, and down this corridor is a shared laundry room. This is a mechanical room. So the things that are most below grade are down here, mechanicals, laundry, stairwell, so that all of the units themselves can have good um, full windows for daylight. So everywhere you see a number, B1, B2, B3, these are individual units. Um, this is the first floor and stacked above that common room is the handicapped accessible unit, which is a larger unit um, with a larger bathroom and living area. And again, units all around here. Um, but you can see there's a little bit of furniture layout in the rooms just to give you a sense of kind of what someone might put into a unit this size. 
Um, they do have, each one has a closet, a little row kitchenette, and uh, a bathroom with a stand-up shower. Uh, and this is the upper floor, which is uh, all residential. Oops, I missed one element here. We have yep. a property manager's office right on this first floor, kind of adjacent to the lobby where you come in. And then upper floor is units stacked on top of the floor below. Any comments you want to make, Tom, on the floor plan? Um, I, I think you have it pretty much. There's the, on the, uh, the open stair only goes up to the, goes between the ground and the first floor. There are two um, enclosed egress stairs, one at either end. Um, you can, uh, on the ground floor, there's an entrance uh, at the street that um, tenants could go in if they wanted to go down that path. Um, and there's also an entrance at, out at the back. At the patio. At, at the patio and then also and out, the out here to where the garden gardens are there. Right. Um, this is just kind of a, an enlarged version of some sample units. They have slightly different sizes, but they're approximately the same square footage uh, and definitely the same types of you know fixtures and features and finishes. Um, one of the emphases for this project is energy efficiency, um, low carbon footprint, and trying to not use fossil fuels. So we have a goal of being Passive House certified, which means we have low energy use per person, uh, a super insulated building envelope, uh, efficient air source heat pump, sometimes called mini splits, for heating, cooling, and for domestic hot water. Uh, mechanical fresh air through an energy recovery ventilator serving all areas. So the building is very tight, which means in order to have good air quality, we're not relying on people just opening windows. So it'll have circulating uh, fresh air to every space in the building. Um, efficient lighting and some solar powered lighting, site lighting, uh, Energy Star appliances, uh, PV panels uh, to the max that we can get based on the roof. Uh, that we are dealing with, as well as the budget that we have to work with. Uh, again, a goal of all electric utilities with no use of fossil fuels. Uh, a low carbon footprint through small efficient units in a walkable location in close proximity to services, shopping, et cetera. So reducing the number of tenants who own cars and reducing the number of vehicle trips per day. Uh, in terms of our timeline, this is just a quick snapshot. This is our best case timeline uh, where we're doing permitting through the summer, uh, applying for funds potentially in the winter. If we were fortunate and, and well prepared, getting funded in the summer that the following year, choosing a GC, going under construction, spring of 2022, um, expecting a little over a year of construction period. We will be doing marketing and, and lotteries leading up to the completion of construction, um, and then an occupancy lease up period, and then what we call stabilized operations, which is typically three to six months of full occupancy. Um, I just wanted to revisit some of the comments that we had from the planning board um, members when we came in February, and these were um, uh, captured in a letter that uh, was written on behalf of the planning board or letter of support. Thank you very much for our project eligibility letter to the state. So one comment was to include one bedroom apartments as well as studios. And so we did a number of floor plans and budget scenarios for building that kind of combined different sizes of units. Uh, on both the construction and operating side, the budgets did not look viable. Um, and making fewer units reduced uh, Valley's ability to provide on-site services because there was less revenue. Uh, another comment was to install a roof over the smoking area, which we've done. Uh, we have kind of an open air pavilion currently um, that's provided in the plans. There's an image of it there that you can see. Uh, we talked about relocating the dumpsters and our, our failure to do that, to find another good place to put them. Um, we do think because they're so far back and screened by a fence and due to grades, they will not be uh, a high visibility kind of item on the site. And uh, we did look at the graphic depiction that we did of how this uh, massing of the building would appear relative to neighboring buildings. And I think that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you. That was an excellent, well-organized presentation. Um, Thank you. I still see no hands, but if there's any 
board members that have a question right now on this, and then I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Chris Bestrup, who has a few words to say. I see, oh, hands changing, sorry. I see Doug and then Maria. Hi, thanks for that. That was really a great presentation. I have one comment uh, about the exterior elevations. I wonder if you could go to one of those. <clears throat> sure, give me one sec. Yeah, so um, the band, the white band that separates the uh, stone or whatever the base is from the yep. siding that's above it, sure. uh, the first floor windows look too far above that. It makes it look like it's a really huge, really high first floor and like uh -huh. typically, typically that kind of band is, is closer to the floor line inside. Okay. So, so I, it seems to me that it would look a little more natural if that transition point happened a few feet higher and closer to the first floor level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria? Um, I just wanna thank you. I don't remember if last time this was Passive House was a goal, but um, it really shows your commitment to energy efficiency and sort of that you know, this is a building to stand the test of time, and it's really um, meeting the challenges that we are currently have with energy and um, carbon footprints. And so, I, I do appreciate that because it's a passive house is a really stringent certification. I don't know if most people it know, is. It, but it's like this um, way of designing houses um, where you can, like, for a, a single family home, heat the whole house with a light bulb for the whole winter. You know, it's that well <laughs> insulated and airtight. And so, yeah. Um, fresh air is a real uh, issue with um, houses or buildings this tight, but um, but I'm sure you have a, a experienced team that can handle um, all yeah. that. Yeah. We, um, we, did, we did not have the passive house goal oh. the first time we met with you. Um, it's, I think it's, it, you know, it's just becoming um, more done in our world. There are, enter there are incentive funds to do it. And the Sergeant House project that I showed you is so, well insulated. It wasn't designed as passive house, but I think we're really close to meeting that standard. And so we, we figured we should reach for it um, in this one. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a really good sort of message to the community and to the people who will be living there. Um, I don't know if you're going to ever get to the lighting plan that was in our packet, but it wasn't in your presentation. And I can't read any of the numbers, and I'm assuming there's no, I think one of your right. said there's no light spread to the neighbors. Right. Yeah. But I want to make sure there's enough light on the yeah. site. Um, yeah. So the blobs yeah. for the, um, I don't know if Pam you have it or, but, but basically I, I think, yeah, just more clarity on how well okay. the site is lit for the next go around or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So we'll it, we'll review that photometrics plan as part of our presentation to the ZBA. And I know when the, when we the size that we gave out, it's it's really hard to see the details. So we'll try to we'll try to do something about that. Our intention is to be um, fully dark sky compliant, no light spill onto neighboring properties, and to have a kind of even soft light. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a lot of light, but what I've learned is it's easier to see when the, the light is fairly even across the site rather than having a bright light somewhere that creates dark spots somewhere else. Yep, that makes sense. Right, right. Okay. And some and, of those are solar ones. Ah, okay. And mm -hmm. we, yeah, I do appreciate all the, the visuals about showing how far back this building is set. So even though the scale meets all, you know, except for, um, I forget what part didn't, maybe all of it match the zoning bylaw requirements, but that the scale feels a lot smaller than these elevations are showing. I mean, elevations are a very abstracted way to look at buildings anyways, because there's no perspective or no depth. But, um, right. but uh, yeah, I appreciate the street views because it really shows it's set back. Um, the, the shape and massing of it kind of fits the neighborhood. So, you know, only when you're right up against it would you ever see it the way elevations portray it. Um, exactly. But um, even so, I mean, the perspectives, they're a little isolated. I mean, I don't remember if I made the comment or someone else made the comment, but I was hoping that the perspectives would be a little bit more like in a context with buildings rather than um, 
a photo, but I, I feel pretty secure in knowing that because of how far set back it is, that it really isn't going to dominate uh, Route 9. You know, it's really set back pretty well. And so um, I guess the perspectives are more just to show the building, not necessarily how it fits with the context. But um, right. yeah, overall, I, yeah, it's a great project. I um, yeah, I think that uh, you you designed it in a way that really, you know, articulate, you could have just made this really smooth box, but you really sort of, you know, went out of your way to make it articulated and match the context language. And then, yeah, and then the passive house goal is just really sort of shows you, shows the commitment you have to making a really good building. So, um, yeah, thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Doug, I see your hand still up. Do you have a, an additional question, or is that just a leftover hand? Just a leftover hand. My apologies. I'll look, no worries. Just wanted to make sure after you had something. Um, I don't know if any other members. So at this point, I'm going to move it to Chris to sort of let it, her, uh, she can tell us what we're to do next. Chris, are you there? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so Hi. this is a comprehensive permit um, application that's going to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Comprehensive permit is sometimes called 40B, and um, many towns fear 40B because it means that a developer can come in and, you know, do something that the town may not like and um, get waivers from their zoning requirements. In our case, um, we have over 10% affordable housing, um, to, and that, that means that over 10% of our housing units overall are um, affordable uh, based on the state um, affordability criteria. So, um, so 10%, I think it's actually t over 12% of our housing is affordable and is on the state, uh, they call it the subsidized housing inventory, which doesn't necessarily mean that the housing is subsidized. It's just that it's been recognized by the state. So in any event, um, Amherst doesn't, um, is not subject to what we call unfriendly 40B application. So, uh, but Amherst does welcome um, good um, projects that provide us with affordable housing. And we have many of them in town. We have um, Mill Valley Estates is one of these um, chapter 40B projects. Um, Butternut Farm, which is at the corner of 116 and Longmeadow Drive is another one. Um, Olympia Oaks, which you might be more familiar with because it was a recent done project up in North Amherst provides about 42 or 44 units for families. Um, we also have the um, the North Square at the Mill District, which was done by Beacon uh, Communities recently. And I think I'm missing one, but I can't remember. But anyway, so we have a number of these types of developments that have been presented to us. Um, and it was, I think most of them, except possibly for Mill Valley Estates, was done after Amherst reached its um, goal of 10% of affordable housing units. So this is a way of um, encouraging affordable housing in Amherst. And um, so what a comprehensive permit does is it allows the Zoning Board of Appeals to kind of take over all the other uh, boards or committees or even some of the town staff um, permits and reviews and kind of bundle them all together, which makes it um, slightly easier for developers to um, get through the process. Obviously, this developer is doing a good job of going around to all of the boards and committees and presenting the project so everybody knows about it. And now um, you're being given an opportunity to review this project and to make recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals is the permit granting authority in this case. And um, you already did make uh, comments back in February. I included your uh, comment, the, the letter uh, describing your comments um, from your February 19th meeting included in, in your packet today. It's towards the end of your packet. Um, but anyway, if you wanted to um, add to those comments and recommendations or uh, just take a vote to um, support this project, um, that would be uh, welcome. Thank you, Chris, for um, those helpful instructions. Um, so, um, I so I assume so. 
we can just support it. But if we have specific recommendations to the ZBA, now would be the time to raise your hand and put them out to the board um, to see if there's general um, agreement that that should be added on. And I just want to say, uh, especially to Laura, thank you for really listening to us, obviously, the last time and coming back and really showing. I had forgotten some of the things we had asked. So um, thank you. It, it, you know, this seems really well thought out. So um, thank you. So I, I don't know if there's much to comment on, but um, well, may I may I offer a comment that one yes. one neighbor um, called me. She's been um, interested in this project and concerned about it. And one of the comments she made, and this may be a minor thing, but I'm going to mention it anyway because I told her I would. Um, but the smoking um, the shed that is designated for smoking, um, she's concerned that it will be. Um, too visible from the Amherst College side of the fence, um, which is on the west side of this property. And she wondered if the smoking uh, shed could be turned around so it's oriented towards this building. And then she also suggested um, strong screening between it and the Amherst College property. And I think, you know, she's, she's worried because in Amherst, we generally don't um, encourage smoking. In this case, it's important to have this facility available because of the population who lives here. Um, but she just wondered if that could be uh, managed. And I noticed that you did talk about the smoking structure and Amherst College, but what kind of screening is that? Is it um, penetrable? Is it evergreen? Sure. Just sure. offering those comments. So um, the comment has come to us as well um, in writing and verbally from um, the neighbor. And so we've been talking a little bit with each other, uh, mainly myself and Rachel, and I think we can accommodate some of those requests. We can certainly have, you know, if we had deciduous plantings, we can do more evergreen type plantings. Um, the, the pavilion is open. It's like a little, it's like a little pavilion, but tiny. Um, it would certainly be possible to put some siding on that, not necessarily solid siding, but, um, you know, some staggered boards or something that would give it a little bit of screening, but still not put people into a, you know, a box. Um, we, our preference is that it face um, the view rather than the house next to it. Um, if you've ever had the privilege of walking on this site, it has a wonderful long view down the hill to the mountains. Um, so, that's kind of why we were wanting to orient it that way. So I think, you know, we can continue to think about it and massage it and discuss it. And I, I certainly think we can easily meet part of that request. Um, I think it would be a shame to turn it around and face it, you know, toward the building that's next to it. We think it could have a nice, you know, almost therapeutic quality, um, being able to sit in it and look down into the valley. So those are our thoughts so far on that. Laura, can I just clarify a little bit on that smoking shed? So you said all four walls are open. Yes. So when you say facing, you just mean like the benches or whatever are looking out that way. So even if you turn the bench around, it's still open walls. Right. Um, and then just to add on a comment that Maria had said earlier, she was commenting on the splits that are there. Um, sure. And she had mentioned noise, but now I'm thinking, because there's not a scale on this drawing, but um, intake, you know, I wouldn't want it close enough that the smoke could get sucked into the units and then sure. people inside could smell it. That was my, yeah. but sure. I know you're trying to balance where to put it, but um, I just wanted to add that. So just to clarify, currently it's an open pavilion with no walls. Uh, in response to this neighbor's comment, we began brainstorming about could we add some cladding on it and where would it go? Um, the intake for the fresh air is not where the mini splits are. They, they do the heating and cooling. And I believe all of the ERVs, um, I think Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the intake and outtake is on the front of the building. Um, so there are two kind of segregated systems, the heating and cooling, and then the fresh air circulation. You're muted, Tom. Just nod if I'm right. Uh, you are right. There may be some on the back, but they're, they're up at uh, the upper levels. 
they're yeah. very high in the building. And, so and they're not, not adjacent to the, the, the not smoking adjacent area. To the smoking area and the, the mini splits don't have any air. So smoking is always a hot topic. We, we, have, we have made properties non-smoking before entirely. And then we have folks standing on the sidewalk out front smoking. So we thought that would be less desirable um, than what we're proposing, but it's always a tricky issue. It is. I'm not seeing other hands, so I'm just going to ask one more question about the smoking room. So on the, the I'm looking at the, it sort of shows the lands, uh, the illustrative site plan. Um, so it looks like trees in front of it, or is that low bushes? You mentioned a view to the west, but if the trees are too high, that sort of blocks it. But also, I think what this neighbor is saying is, you know, if people are walking by at Amherst College, Will they be able to see people sitting on a bench smoking? So right. just clarifying the uh, landscape. Yeah. So um, I went, I pulled us back to that site plan page. Here's the smoking area. So this distance, I don't know, Rachel, help me out. Are we looking uh -huh. about 20, 15, 20 feet going this way? Yeah, yeah, about right. About 15 or 20 feet. And then we have another, you know, maybe 15 feet. And then we have a parking lot. So we're not adjacent, this smoking area is not adjacent to the field or the field house, it's adjacent to park, a parking lot. So it's not a place where people are spending time necessarily. I hear once in a while there's big events and there might be people there, but in general, there are cars here or it's empty. Um, so in terms of the visual, these are, I believe, deciduous and that's what I was referring to. It's certainly could be swapped out for something that's more of an evergreen style. Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, are there any other questions that people want to add or uh, uh, Maria? And then I was, oh, hands popping on and off. Uh, Maria? Um, am I reading that site plan correctly where uh, you have an existing fence that you're going to rem it remains and that's on the sort of left side of the page as we're looking at it. but does it also wrap around the top side or not because I'm seeing yes. The yes yeah okay. so Am Amherst College owns a kind of black metal right and then so it starts here and it comes mm -hmm. to the edge of there I think it comes to about here yeah right. then it goes this way and it's like yeah. eight feet high or so, or it, it's pretty it's that high. Um, but they also have a pretty nice row of arbor vitae that are growing mm -hmm. in this area. So we'll be kind of doubling up on the vegetation uh, between the athletic field and the building. Okay, all right, thanks. And then the neighbors on this side have requested uh, removal of the trees that are there now um, and an eight foot fence, cedar fence. Uh, and plantings on both sides. And that's what we're showing. Great. I'm still not um, seeing any other members' hands. So at this time, um, we could just have a motion um, where that we could vote on in support of this project. Excuse me, Christine, there was one, there was one um, attendee who had a comment. That's yes, right, thank that you. So, Mm. So I did say that we would take public comment for a max of 30 minutes and that the board won't be commenting on comments tonight, but that Ms. Bestrup, the director of planning, um, per her decision, if she has some um, clarifying information that she might speak to the question. So at this time, I see one hand. Um, so if there's any others who want to speak on this, raise their hands now. Uh, confirming, Pam, are there any telephone Collins. No, I just see the one person who is named Catherine Sims. Great. So um, if we can allow her to uh, turn on her mic, and I'll say wel welcome to Catherine Sims. Please give your name and address, and especially if you're not Catherine Sims. <laughs> uh, thanks. I, I am, yes, uh, and but I would prefer to not have my name be part of the permanent record, if that's okay. I do live close to this property and have talked to Christine on multiple occasions. So I'm, and to Laura. So I think they can probably both vouch that I am legitimately a neighbor of the property. Okay. Um, thank you very much for letting me speak. Can you hear me okay? We can, you're very clear. Okay, do you see me or do you just hear me? We do not see you, we only okay. hear you. 
<laughs> I'm not so familiar with this format. It is new to me. We, it's still pretty new to us too. So, <laughs> yes. but welcome. Um, so, thank you very much. I, I did want to make a public comment. Um, so uh, from the beginning, I've actually been here since the beginning of your meeting. Um, and I definitely agree with a lot of what was said earlier about having a, a true housing crisis in town. And I think that 40B is a very appropriate um, use here to increase uh, housing. And I definitely support the development of affordable housing at 132 Northampton Road. Um, and I do want to especially thank Christine uh, for trying to meet with neighbors throughout this process. I'm not the neighbor she was referring to earlier, though I do have some similar uh, questions about smoking. So I guess I just want to note overall that uh, the developer here is asking for a special permit. And the planning board spent a lot of time talking earlier about how the the bar for special permits to override existing use should be pretty high. That should be a high bar of review. Um, and I would like to bring up uh, two specific issues that I think the board really should consider very seriously at this time. Um, the first one, it sounds like you have considered a little bit, which is really the need for family housing or for this development to include something other than just single unit housing. Um, that has consistently been stated to be the highest need for affordable housing in the state and in the town of Amherst. It's, it's for family housing. If you look at the state affordable housing guidelines, um, I was just looking them up during the meeting, on page 72, they say that there is a critical need for all housing in the state, but particularly family and special needs housing for low and moderate income housing. And that the program that they're applying to for funding here encourages the development of that uh, family-oriented housing. And so I, I would ask the board to try to consider seriously why there is no family or family special needs housing being developed here in what would be such a great family location, right? There are 28 kids within the 500 foot buffer of this development. Uh, 21 are resident children and, and four frequently uh, visiting grandkids um, and then uh, a, a couple others. Uh, we've estimated that there's 30 to 40 children in a radius of 0.3 miles of this development. So Laura didn't really mention any of that when she talked about characterizing the neighborhood, but um, there are a lot of kids here. And, you know, for a $6 million project, it just seems like a really lost opportunity that there would be no family housing to try to answer these, these needs. Um, the planning board apparently did ask them to think about one bedroom apartments. And so I guess I'm just asking, did you ever see those budgets that they prepared? Did you look closely at the numbers? Did you think about whether it was possible to actually include family housing as part of this development? So that was first point. Second point, um, hopefully, if I may speak for a couple more minutes, uh, second point and question would be that this development really should be a smoke-free community. I was glad to hear Laura say that they have done that for some of their other developments. Um, and as Christine mentioned, the town of Amherst is a smoke-free community. If you look at the town regulations, they say, uh, they say scientific evidence indicates that there is no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke and that it causes disease and premature death in children and adults. The town of Amherst doesn't allow any smoking in public buildings. It doesn't allow any smoking within 20 feet of public buildings. Um, and other recent and recently updated developments with affordable housing in town are smoke-free. So it is my understanding that Rolling Green is a smoke-free community and that the North Square at the Mill District, which was recently developed and went through an extensive process like this one, is also a smoke-free community. Why should the North Square at the Mill District be a smoke-free community? And these residents shouldn't have those same rights to be a smoke-free community. Um, I think this is entirely possible and could be recommended by the planning board uh, to the zoning board. And um, I think, you know, given the high demand for affordable housing, there's likely many future residents who would find the smoke free aspect a very attractive feature. Um, so I don't think it would detract at all from what they're trying to do. And I think it would just make it even better than it already is. Um, I do also just really want to highlight what is happening at that site. That parking lot is a place where uh, everybody is coming and going. That's also the entrance to Pratt Field. That is where the accessible parking happens uh, for all of the games. There are frequently parents setting up tailgates along that fence that's shown in the picture right here. 
There are athletes coming and going uh, to different events, you know, hanging out there waiting for the bus right up next to that fence all the time. Um, on the other side, on the left side, is the track. Probably 100 feet away is the track. Like, this is just right in the middle of an athletic facility. And that is not really an appropriate place for there to be smoking, I don't think. Um, so, you know, I, I would love there to be smoking if there were space on the parcel for that to happen in a, in a safe way. I just don't see that there is any actual space on a parcel of this size with a building of this size for there to be a safe place for smoking. For the residents too, you all mentioned, you know, how is there gonna be safe intake uh, of air to the building? And I think it would just be so much better to make this a smoke-free community. So those are the two points I really hope this, the planning board will take seriously, uh, family housing and a smoke-free community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other public hands. Um, so I'll go back to the panelists. Uh, so is there any more comments the board wants to make or do we want to make a motion and support? Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, there's lots of things to love about this. Um, and I, I just want to encourage, I love the warm exterior lights that you talked about, Laura, rather than the blue. I think that's an important, that's one of my little pet peeves. Mm -hmm. I love the covered bike storage, another one of my little things. Um, I like the grass pavers, uh, the flow of the sidewalks. I think the gardening options are awesome. Um, and the setback being so large, I think is uh, an asset. Um, it's going to be a beautiful building, but it's also, I think, at first, nice to minimize its strength and um, get people used to it. Uh, so um, I see Janet's hand. You know, I think I asked this question last time, but I don't quite remember the answer. So if somebody um, was in this apartment and renting and they have a child or if you got pregnant and had a child, could you stay in the apartment if you, um, could the child live with you or would you have to move out? Right. I mean, we talked last time about people who might be getting, um, you know, restoring their parental rights and having visitation, but they also could just be divorced and have, you know, visitation times back and forth. And I just don't, I'm wondering if there's some flexibility there. Cause I think the goal here is really to provide people with homes and have them stay in our community, not kind of bounce from spot to spot, which is the problem you're trying to eradicate. Um, so it depends on the size of the unit. So there's a board of health um, standard for how many square feet you need per person in a unit. Mm -hmm. So larger than 250 square feet, you can have a second occupant. If it's smaller than that, it's only designed for a single occupant. So there's some variability in the size of these units. Most of them are sized for a single person. Uh, the handicapped units, for example, would meet that threshold and be, be larger. Um, we've owned, Valley's owned housing like this for decades. Um, and we have not seen a lot of examples where people have wanted to live um, in, to, to put more than one person in a space this size. Um, we have had tenants who've gotten pregnant. We have had tenants who've reunified with their children. And we've simply worked with them to find a more suitably sized uh, place to live. Okay. If I can add, can I add one thing to that, Laura? Laura? We, th there are a bunch of number of units that are in the corner of the building, the outside corners, and those are 266 square feet. So they're, they're over 250. So technically that might be possible. So I'm not seeing any hands. Um, does someone want to make a motion in support of this effort to send to the ZBA? I see Michael's hand and then Maria. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, uh, I move the uh, planning board recommend to the Zoning Board of Appeals the uh, granting a comprehensive permit uh, for the uh, 132 Northampton Road property as designed. Second. Thank you, Michael. 
and Maria has seconded. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion on that? <clears throat> I'm seeing no hands, so if I see, okay. So at this point, we could move to a roll call vote. Um, we have the motion that Michael just said, and I will go through the roll call. Still see no hands. Okay, Michael Burtwistle. Yes. Maria. Yes. Jack. Yes. David. Yes. Doug. Yes. Janet? Yes. And myself, Christine? Uh, yes. So that's seven zero zero. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you for all your hard work. This is definitely something that's needed in Amherst. Great. I'm just sorry you, much. you don't have a magic wand to get to 2023. 20, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I know it's 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 a it, it's amazing how long these things take they eventually happen but it, it's a long haul thanks for continuing on thank you thank you for your time thanks Laura sure thank you Laura Laura will you forward me your slides of course thank you sure okay so at this time we're gonna move on with our agenda um, I will go to item five. Chris, is there any old business? No old business. Okay. Is there any item six new business? No new business. <laughs> Are there any um, item seven form A, A and R subdivision applications? No form A's. Okay, let's keep going. Any upcoming ZBA applications? No, nothing new. <laughs> okay. I suppose it's only been a week. So anyways, um, uh, item nine, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUVs applications. No. Okay. Uh, 10, we'll move on to planning board committee and liaison reports. Um, I'll just run through it. We haven't done that. Uh, PVPC, um, Jack, is there anything to report on that? Any upcoming meetings? Uh, there is, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm apologetic here. I don't know when it is. Uh, I think it's, it might be next Thursday. Okay. I just really hadn't thought about well, it. You could probably look on their website. So uh, many Zoom meetings, you know? Hmm. And now you have to watch for two. I just want to mention again that Jack has been invited to be on the executive committee um, for PVPC. So, um, You'll have twice as much to report on. Uh, CPAC, Community Preservation Act Committee. Michael, I know you guys have a meeting coming up. Yeah, there's been significant amount of conversation relative to the <clears throat> funding, uh, the allocation, the recommendation, sorry, for funding uh, of the um, <clears throat> uh, special collections wing of the library. Um, <clears throat> there was, um, a, and a, a straw vote was taken um, last spring before the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, scare came on. And that was uh, just that, it was, it was a straw vote. And the usual process for the committee is to take a straw vote to place the requested items <clears throat> on a slate and then go back and review them individually. Uh, that review didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, um, while we were waiting for that, awaiting that to happen, um, several mem two members of the committee uh, contacted uh, people at the um, at the state level about the propriety of using CPA funds to um, essentially build a new wing. Uh, the issue being whether or not historic preservation can be used, monies can be used to build something new. Um, the reason the issue came up was that, at least one of the reasons the issue came up was that when the library made its initial proposal, which was for one and a half million dollars as opposed to one million, which was subsequently suggested, um, the uh, formula, a formula was introduced, which 
suggested that the CPA monies should equal 10.02% of the total budget of the library because this, the special collections wing was going to take up 10.02% .2%, of the new building. Um, some people on the committee felt that it was inappropriate for the committee to be providing money for bricks and mortar um, and would prefer to be providing money for a specific items such as um, <clears throat> uh, climate control, uh, fire suppression, uh, items that were not necessarily part of the library, would not have necessarily been part of the library's overall budget if the library did not have a special collections room. Um, so over the last three weeks or so, uh, this issue has been bounced back and forth among the members of, this, of CPAC and uh, has uh, resulted in, as of the day before yesterday, or maybe a little bit before that, a, a letter from the town manager saying essentially that uh, CPAC's input has already been received and that the, um, uh, the, there's no longer, a need, it's, its work is done. There's no longer need for another meeting. Uh, nonetheless, we are having another meeting and I'm not quite sure uh, under what authority and, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what is intended to be done at that meeting. Uh, the only thing I am sure about it is that it's uh, June 30th uh, at six o'clock. Um, so that's about as much as I know about the issue. Who is your staff liaison for that group? Um, Anthony, um, what's his last name? Del De Delaney. Anthony Delaney. Okay. And working, essentially working for Sonia Aldrich. So are you taking comments and... We are getting comments. <laughs> I'm not sure that's okay. the thing. We have something like 25 comments, uh, essentially all uh, against, almost all against uh, the uh, allocation of the funds for the purposes that requested. I just have one more question. So if the monies didn't go to this special collections library wing, what would happen to that money? Uh, it, would be put, it would be put on hold for next year. Okay. Uh, it is also, sorry, it, it has also been suggested that should the library choose to bring another slightly different proposal asking for essentially the same amount of money, but specifying specific uses for that money, then the then members of the committee would have a different point of view on, on the issue. Like the climate change yeah. that you said before, which I know the irony of it is it's a new building to house historic documents mm. that need modern control, but yeah. Exactly, that's the problem. Yeah. Um, I see Jack and then Janet's hand. Oh, um, I, I don't, I don't understand um, the debate and, 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 and why we would, you know, it's so hard to get money, number one, but I, I feel like splitting hairs, we have money, it's been uh, justified by town council that we're in the, you know, fine. I, I don't understand why you, why CPAC would be doing such a thing. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just my, that's my uh, feeling. That's your it, opinion. It, it just seems, yeah, I, I, wow, I, that's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> right. um, thank you. And I see Janet and Michael's hand up, but you're there. Yeah, Janet. Uh, Janet, your mic is off. I'm falling into my old habits. Um, I have a question about timing. So. The request is coming for CPAC money. You know, it, it can't. It starts in the fall, and it processes, and you say yes or no, and then it goes to the town council. But if the library has to, the library new project has to go through a whole process, and probably that money wouldn't be needed for several years. So, do you just take that million and stick it in an account, or it just seems like the timing is off or something? Is that you know? Because I mean, I, I I I'm also thinking I was at an Amherst or attended um, 
an Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust meeting and they were looking for extra money for people to keep people in their homes, like just basically giving people rent money. And they had $200,000 they could hand out and they were looking for more sources. And so I was kind of thinking, oh, that's an immediate need because of the COVID epidemic. And even if you wanted to give that money to the library, it wouldn't be used for a couple of years. So how, how does that timing issue work out? If that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael, it, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, I got unmuted. I got a hand raised, lowered for some reason. Uh, to, to Janet's question, the timing is, uh, is typical of CPAC uh, uh, recommendations. Many recommendations from CPAC are for two, three year, over two or three year periods. Uh, so that's not unusual. Uh, it, it, the money is not um, spent until it's needed but it's allocated and we are CPAC is allowed to allocate X number to recommend the allocation of X number of dollars per year based on a complicated state formula, uh, something like a hundred and a million, 500,000, something like that this year. Um, so uh, the notion that um, the library is applying for it now prior to the approval of the uh, overall proposal by the town council, and prior to any kind of voter approval that may or may not be necessary, uh, and prior to the actual delivery of the uh, library, the state library grant, uh, is not inconsistent with the way the CPAC generally uh, operates. Um, those of those who are uh, uh, voting or interested in the further discussion of this issue. Um, are very mindful of the fact that the, uh, the certainly the current emergency housing needs uh, are part of CPAC's uh, overall uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, and then I, I, Michael, I have one more question. So I don't have a legal opinion, but I, I understand the dispute is, can you, can CPAC give money to a new building? Like can they, new construction for historic preservation and the argument back is it's not for the new building it's for space in the new building which is seems like a lawyer's debate is there more like research going to be done than the, the, those two positions there's some help on the way because it's you know i mean uh, there are it, they are called legal opinions for a reason you know? um uh the the chair of the of cpac uh contacted the uh uh, Stuart Siganor, the director of, um, I can't remember the name of the exact organization. Let me find it. Um, um, anyway, it's a state organization, not a governmental organization, but a state or organization who's, who takes it as their responsibility to review and advise on the various issues relating to, to the Community Preservation Act. Um, the uh, town, that, that, in, that, in, that, um, um, that information uh, was uh, supplant, uh, supported by uh, another conversation that one of the board members had with uh, an attorney in the, in, in, a, in a governmental office. I, I get the details, I get, have eluded me at the moment. Um, and that, <coughs> um, that uh, opinion uh, supported the notion that um, it was an inappropriate use of CPAC funds. But to, 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 I'm going to come back to the question of uh, the other side. The, uh, uh, it appears to some of us that the, um, the, the legislation which authorizes CPA funds is is very specific in saying that CPA funds may not be used for new constructions. Uh, CPA funds in the historic preservation category cannot be used for new construction. Uh, the, uh, the town manager consulted uh, uh, the town's lawyer and uh, came back with uh, a, um, an opinion uh, which uh, while not exactly contradicting 
that the opinion that uh, the the board got from uh, the, the state offices, which said that it, it basically is um, an open question uh, that there's no law, on, there's no law on which, no adjudicated law on which um, that claim uh, of legality or illegality could be made. And it's up to the uh, local um, uh, CPAC to, uh, to make that judgment. Um, so that's, does that answer your question? I hope so. I was just wondering, is there going to be more research or some other sources, or is it just going to be? Well, like any, like any, like any um, um, commission or committee or board, uh, we're at the, we're at the mercy of for staff support at the mercy of uh, whoever the staff support is, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, it has been, as far as I understand it, decided that uh, this is a closed issue. And so therefore there is no more uh, research being done. Now, what effect another vote will have on this issue, I have no idea, but we're having a meeting. All right, thank you. Again, on June 30th at 6 p.m. Yes. And that will be on Zoom, so you can go. So, yes. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I think we all had a lot of questions on that. Um, Agricultural Commission, David? Is there anything? Have you guys been meeting? I see. I saw you looking for members. Maybe David's not. No, nope. you look frozen, David. He does so, look frozen. Um, I'll come back. Uh, back to Michael, Design Review Board. Nothing to report. Okay, and uh, Maria zoning. This hasn't met. So, um, two, five, four. Oh, now you're choppy and you did move. Oh, I see you blink. David, are you there? <laughs> I, I am here. <laughs> Is there I, 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 I missed the Agricultural Commission meeting. I've got, I've done it. <laughs> you were frozen. Um, now you're unfrozen. Is there anything to report? I missed the meeting and I have nothing to report. Okay, and they have monthly meetings, how often? Do yes, they? I think it's the first or second Tuesday. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, report of chair, I have nothing. Report of staff, Chris? I don't have any report. I just appreciate everybody listening to me tonight about my point of view about the voting requirements and it was a very robust discussion. So uh, I feel satisfied that I was well heard. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate all your hard work. I think we can do an adjournment. Do I have a motion? We'll end this gig at 9.57. Good work, everybody.